Okay, good evening and welcome to the December 21st Chino City Council meeting. For the record, please note that Mayor Yoola is absent. All other city council members are present. And at this time, I'd like to ask City Council Person Comstock to lead us in the flag salute. Thank you, Member Tom. Ladies and gentlemen, will you please join me in saluting our nation's flag? Thank you. And I'd like to call on the city manager, Matt Ballantyne, to report any agenda additions or revisions. Yes, Mayor Pro Tem, uh, Lucio, and the rest of the council. Um, I would staff's requesting that we um, pull item number eight, which deals with the national opioid settlements. Uh, we, we want to defer to the county, uh, but also defer it back to staff so we can develop a resolution so that we can um, memorialize on what we're doing towards this uh, this national crisis. Okay. So, so I'd request that item number eight be uh, pulled and returned to staff. Okay. And I see that uh, there's a request for the public to pull item number nine. Um, Mr. Stubby Barr would also like to pull no item number nine. And can I... Can I get a vote on the balance of the consent calendar? Uh, Mayor Pro Tem, um, may we uh, move on to public announcements next and okay. then we'll... Okay. So at this point, we'll move on to public announcements. With Christmas and New Year's just around the corner, I would like to remind everyone of our holiday closures at City Hall. First in observance of Christmas Eve and Christmas Day, City Hall will be open half day from 7.30 to noon on Thursday, December 23rd in observance of Christmas Eve. City Hall will be closed all day on Friday, December 24th, in observance of Christmas. Then in observance of Christ New Year's Eve and New Year's, City Hall will be open half day, 7.30 a.m. to noon on Thursday, December 30th, in observance of New Year's Eve. City Hall will be closed all day on Friday, December 31st, in observance of New Year's. Lastly, as many of you know, tonight's council meeting will be our last in 2021. I know I speak on behalf of the entire city council when I say we are honored to serve such an outstanding community and it's our residents and businesses that make Chino such a unique place. We're excited for what 2022 has in store for us in the city of Chino, but until then, on behalf of Mayor Uola and the entire Chino City Council, I wish you all the very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. And at this point, I'd like to call on John Mata from Calvary Chapel, Chino Valley. And at this time, if you'd like to invite everyone who wishes to join us in the invocation to please stand. Mayor Pro Tem, City Council members, Merry Christmas. <clears throat> and on behalf of Pastor David Rosales in Calvary Chapel, Chino Valley, thank you for this privilege of allowing, me, allowing us to pray here. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we come before you, Lord, and, and we lay this council meeting at your feet. We thank you for your hand that has always been on this great city of Chino. We thank you for your grace and mercy and for your protection, Lord. And now, Lord, we ask that your wisdom and discernment would, would be upon the mayor and mayor pro tem, the city council members, city manager, city attorney, all those who are in uh, first responders and, and the police department that are here representing the departments, Lord, I ask that your hand would be upon them. And Lord, that you may guide the affairs of this meeting, Lord, 
and that your hand will always be upon this beautiful city of Chino. Thank you for those who are here, Lord, and their members that are represented. May we always remember the true season for Christmas, Lord, and as we move into the new year, Lord, we ask that your I will guide us continually to reach those around us, Lord, for your kingdom. And Lord, again, thank you for this time. We ask, Lord, that you'd be a part of this meeting moving forward. In Jesus' name, amen. Merry Christmas. At this time, members of the public may present testimony as to an item that should be removed from the consent calendar for separate discussion. Unless a member of the public or city council request that an item be removed from the consent cal calendar, all items will be acted upon whole on a one vote. Other than uh, Mr. Barr wishing to pull item number nine, is there anybody else in the public that would like to pull an item? And also, just as a reminder, we're going to pull item number eight. Correct. We're also pulling item number eight. If there's nothing else, then I'll ask for I'm a sorry, vote. Um, Mr. Mayor Pro Tem, I think there's also a, a segment for public comments in general on items not on the agenda. Okay. That, um, maybe you could combine that and ask if any members of the public wish to speak on non agenda items. Okay. If any member would like to speak on a. Okay. On the prior page. Okay. At this time, I'd, uh, I don't see that. Okay, uh, I see that uh, we do have some people that would like to speak on items that are not on the agenda. I'll go ahead and call the people's names that I have a green slip for. If there's somebody else that doesn't that would like to speak and hasn't filled out a green slip, please do so. Or at the end, when everybody has spoken, we'll go ahead and call upon anybody else that would like to say something. So at this time, I'd like to call, call upon Cristana Chusio. Chusos, and this is in regards to road closures in the preserve. Good evening. My name is Christiana Trusios, and I am a longtime homeowner in the preserve at Chino. The residents in the preserve are fed up with being landlocked in our community, despite our pleas with the city for assistance. The road closures in the preserve caused by delays in construction schedules and flooding due to storms make it impossible to get in or out of our community in a timely manner. The extreme delay in reopening Kimball continues to leave Bickmore as the only viable option to get in and out of the community, creating traffic backup so extreme that the police have to come out every morning during rush hour to direct traffic. And even that does not mitigate the issue. Residents have, are having to consistently leave 30 to 45 minutes earlier than before the Kimball closure began to allow for traffic during rush hour and in some cases, that hasn't even been enough. Frequent accidents and semi-truck traffic make commuting in unpredictable. It seems in some instances that the city is unaware of what roads are closed and is not updating residents. Yesterday, Flight Avenue was closed in the morning north of Kimball, making it even harder to find an open road out of the community. One resident had to go four miles out of their way to go north out of the preserve. When the transportation manager was contacted about the issue, the resident was told that they were unaware of any closures. This is before even adding weather as a factor to road closures. Last week, in addition to the Kimball closure, Bickmore, again, the only main road out of the preserve that's been open, was shut down for flooding, as was Pine. The response from the city was that this was due to clogged storm drains. The flooding and road closures happen every year, nearly every time it rains. Based on the predicted severity of last week's storm, in my many years of experience with this issue as a longtime resident, I elected to use my personal time at work and take the day off out of fear of not being able to get back to my own home or pick up my child due to flooding and road closures. Listen to that again. I had to use my own personal time to stay home because I knew if I left, there's an excellent chance that I could neither pick up my child on time, let alone get access to my home. I'm sure some of you are sitting there thinking it couldn't possibly be as bad as I'm describing it. I cordially invite you to come to the preserve during rush hour and or school drop off or pick up in your personal vehicle, especially if you have somewhere to be afterwards at a time certain, and let me know what you think. Even better, let's schedule that during the next storm, maybe later this coming week. 
These road issues no doubt force any, many other residents to make the same judgment calls if they are lucky enough to have personal time available to use. Moreover, the frequent road conditions discourage residents from shopping within our community the majority of the time. We find it much easier to go to Eastvale rather than to play the guessing game of whether or not we'll be able to find a route out of the community to get to North Chino. So other cities and counties are benefiting from our situation when I'm sure you and we would much rather keep our business and our money in our community. We're tired. Where quality of life is greatly diminished, especially at this time of year when we see an uptick in inclement weather. We've emailed, we've spoken at office hours at the preserve, we've taken time out of our busy schedules four days before Christmas to appeal to you here. And we fear based on the inaction we've seen on these issues every time before, that the only way to make things change will be for us to make different choices at the ballot box during the next voting cycle. Thank you for your time. Thank you. I'd also like to call on Cindy Martinez. Hi, uh, Cindy Martinez, I'm from the preserve as well. And just as Christiana, my neighbor and friend was stating same situation, same comments essentially. I am a person who works from home on a regular basis, uh, even pre-COVID, and getting in and out of our community is just extremely hard. And so going east is a whole lot easier than it is to go west or north. It's even easier to go south to Corona, unfortunately. So to just get out of our community just because of the single lane roads, the added uh, trucks, the um, road closures, regardless of inclement weather, just be with Kimball and trying to figure out a route to get anywhere into Chino is just extremely hard. Um, Merrill is a great uh, avenue or route to get around. However, it's unsafe to turn left. There's not really a street light for us to be able to go and turn left without fearing traffic from either side along with semi-trucks. Um, cops on Bickmore are needed all the time, utilizing those resources in, in that instance as opposed to utilizing them where we really need them um, in protecting our community as opposed to just directing traffic. Um, utilizing our resources is where we, we really want um, to be focused on, not uh, directing traffic. And again, we just continue to go east towards Corona and East Fail to spend our money, unfortunately, because it's just so much easier to get out of the island going that way as opposed to going north. So. Thank you. And the next one is David, I can't, is it Michaels? Uh, yes. This is preserve issues, violations of parking and lack of area to shop. Go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, I, I'll speak briefly and reinforce what the previous two speakers said. Uh, the uh, issue with getting in and out of the preserve is becoming um, really acute. Uh, and I think uh, exacerbating that is just the overall approach to development in the city. It seems like this was begun as a bedroom community. It's, uh, uh, you know, a, with, with developments for single family homes with people living here. And um, the uh, construction seems to be almost exclusively warehouses these days, large warehouses being thrown up everywhere, everywhere you look. Uh, and uh, this is impacting the, um, um, the roads. I think a lot of the road closures are, have to do with construction. Um, the, the, uh, the large moving machines are tearing up uh, the, the road beds making the roads uh, uh, potholed and pitted, difficult to get around on, um, causing damage. And my wife's car hit a pothole recently, and it was uh, about $1,200 in damage to the, uh, to the axle of the car. Um, and uh, I, I think it's general, it's just we, we need to think about what kind of development we're doing, um, if they're going to be, if this is, going to be just a, a, a community of huge warehouses with houses, housing developments scattered in between, it is going to have a very detrimental impact on the quality of the life for people who live here. And uh, I'd like to see us perhaps 
slow down the warehouse development and, and uh, think in a more sort of a holistic uh, view about making this, you know, the, the um, um, introduction to the city council meeting speaks about what a great place to live Chino is. It could be, but I think we, uh, we need to think about uh, rather than making it uh, a great community for huge warehouses and big trucks uh, for for families and for uh, and and for and for people to live here, the quality of life. So those are my comments. Thank you. We have Steve Robinoff. Good evening, uh, Mayor Pro Tem and Honorable Council Members. Thank you for allowing us public uh, to come and speak and to address you. Like the previous speakers have uh, mentioned already, my issue as well is in regards to the preserve area. Um, seems like I was just here about three years ago addressing City Council regarding the same concerns that we um, had. And that was when Big Moore had the huge sinkhole on it and we had a lot of roads that were closed around our neighborhood and also flooding. And I want to repeat what I said three years ago now, that I've always wanted to live on an island, just not in China. And so I'm saying it again three years later. Um, like the previous spoke, speaker spoke, it's hard to get in and out of our island. And literally, that's how it feels like at times. Um, I have a son who started working and driving right here in Chino, uh, works on the north end of town. I have to ha tell him to leave about 45 minutes early uh, to go to work because I want to teach him responsibility and to be on time. And so before it would take him 20 minutes, now it's taking about 45 minutes just to get to work um, in the morning and try to get a almost uh, nearly, well, he just turned 17 year old up earlier. It is hard if you have any teenage kids uh, yourself, but I applaud him for that. Um, also, unless something is done um, as a long-term temporary fix, because it seems like things just don't happen as fast as maybe we think they should or we would like them to see. Um, so I like to see some long-term temporary fixes, at least show us that there's some progress being uh, made, because the preserve is just gonna continue to be developed. Um, I think what we're at, maybe 40%, maybe 45% built out. Um, there's lots of homes that are being built. There's lots of you know people moving there. I know it's not Orange County, but it's somewhere where a lot of us did move from LA County, Orange County here, because it's affordable. It's a great community. We have a lot of great neighbors there. A lot of great people live there. And uh, we do that because it's a great place to raise our family. Um, in my opinion, I know I read some comments on some of the group pages that we have on Kimball. One of the um, responses was is that they is delayed because of some San Bernardino County permits that were delayed the project a little bit. Um, then in, in, in essence, the city should have never given the contractor an NTP a notice to proceed without ensuring that all permits were issued and that everything was lined up. Uh, my question is, will the contractor be held liable for this? What are the residents gonna gain from this inconvenience? Um, are there gonna be other additional services provided to us, maybe some streets we repaved, um, you know, other items that we would like? Um, before a project starts and a traffic plan is created and approved, I believe more thought needs to happen. And engineers could look at stuff black and white and on paper, but unless they drive it, like somebody said, why don't you come out and take a look? I've noticed that with engineers. Very smart people. We, I'm sure that there's some really intelligent folks here um, that do these plans and know how to get work on, um, on that, but drive it, you know? Come out here and take a look at, at a plan. Um, I believe that there was more planning done in the Christmas parade that happens one day a year for traffic plan than there was for a whole thousands of residents to move through our town. And I think that needs to change. Um, after enough of us complained about the traffic on Bickmore, um, when there was no one out there, finally our um, brave and honorable um, police officers are out there um, helping direct traffic. And I thank them for that. Thank you for your service of being out there. I know it's not the most pleasant thing to do. It, they want to be out there keeping us safe, but they're directing traffic. Um, each street is still going to get work done on it, how we continue building out there. Um, and we have to worry about how we're ever going to leave our homes. Um, I used to work in public works um, as a public works manager. Whenever that I did projects, it was always in the benefit of the residents. I would always make sure that we were at less impact to residents as possible. 
not closing a street down for months at a time. I would always try to keep a lane open, at least one lane of traffic open at all times, whether that be making them put a traffic control person on the east or west or north and south of things and letting at least one flow of traffic go through at a time, you know, radios and you communicate back and forth, at least during peak hours. I did offer that suggestion, not sure if it went anywhere. However, that's some suggestion that, that I would make, at least during, you know, 7 a.m. to 9 a.m. and again from, say, 5 p.m. to 7 p.m., at least something for us. They're not usually, it's not a big uh, request, I don't believe. Um, an analogy that I can give you about our bottleneck situation is like having two funnels, but the skinny end is up against each other. You have Eastvale and Ontario on one end, you have Chino in the middle, and you have Chino Hills and other locations, and that's what it feels like when you go uh, through our town. Um, as I mentioned before, I was a public works manager, and to be honest, I would be embarrassed knowing that this was the job that I was doing for the city if I was out there with the roads the way they are. Um, we all know it's going to rain this week and next week. When I was public works manager, I know there's only a few things that you could do in the rain. You're pretty much dealing with falling down trees. You're fall de dealing with um, huge uh, potholes, but you can't really do anything with it because um, the asphalt won't stick. And then you're dealing with um, floods, pretty much. So I'd like to see if is there catch basins being cleaned out right now as we speak. Is there people that are going out there and you know preparing the roads for the amount of rain. And I know our streets really weren't built for the amount of rain that we have, and it's take millions of dollars to improve, uh, you know, the infrastructure. I, I get that. But when I would suggest to the Public Works Department, I, maybe they do already, they should have some hot spot locations. You break up your division, you break up your team, and you have people that are there. My wife did mention somebody that was there during the rain uh, last week, and uh, they're just sitting in their truck. You know, I'd like to see some folks that are out there. I mean, working, getting, trying to get address the issue. I thank you, Council Member Comstock. I mean, it's sad that it took you to drag city staff out there to go and take a look at it. I would expect our city staff to be out there proactively. How many times do we have to address this issue before we get a proactive city staff? It takes us having to call and email and call and email before proactively doing it. Drive in. When you're on your way to City Hall, drive in. Come, go through the preserve. Go take a look. Why not? You know, why not? Um, also, I think that there's a hands-off approach from some here today. Um, I think that we need to remember that there is an organizational chart in public service and public government that I like. It's the residents first. Then everything flows down below. I think right now it's the opposite way around. We're politicians are at the top, city staff, managers, and us residents are trickle, trickle down. Maybe we get the crumbs at the bottom of the table. That needs to change, and it needs to change fast. We're asking for help. We're bringing our concerns to your um, table. Also, I'm not sure if I should even invite my family members over for Christmas Day. Do they need to bring jet skis? Do they need to bring kayaks and boats? Maybe they could float down El Prado Dam, right? Maybe there'll be enough water there where I could have them go across to the 91 and 71. Uh, when meetings are held at the Preserve Community Center, it feels like it's all smoke and all mirrors. Uh, it's just all updates, but no change. I don't actually get assurance that when you are speaking that someone's actually engaging you and actually listening, taking down your concerns, and actually doing something with it afterwards. You know, you could nod your head and do this and oh yeah you know here's an update as you are aware tired of that we're tired of those emailed canned responses to all of us residents we all get the same email and it's it's just ridiculous already um there's more effort put into rebuilding your community center here than there is for the preserve we saw those maps and how luxurious you guys want to do this why why how about some uh on main street public was never included in any of those things and the mayor said something we need to have we need to have the say where we live we need to be able to be that voice not the public not them and also on one of the facebook group pages somebody did mention that why don't you just sell the preserve to uh eastvale let them annex us they got a sprouts they got lots of development they got a hotel they got starbucks they have tons of stuff that are going in they're just doing awesome and that's where I do all my shopping at, to be honest with you. So, you know, maybe, maybe we can ask uh, 
Eastvale to annex us and improve our quality of life. Thank you again. It's not a knock. I mean, I'm trying to be as, as respectful as, as I can, but you know, when I get my family is getting impacted and my neighbors and their families are being impacted, something needs to, to happen, please. That's all, you know? And I know you guys are doing your public service as best as you guys can and uh, with the limited resources, but we do ask, please, please help us. Thank you. Thank and you. Merry Christmas, Happy New Year to you all. Thank you. We have Zach Miller. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Zach, High City Council. Good to see you guys. Uh, I'm here mostly just to uh, make my voice heard as part of the preserved community. Um, I've lived here for six years. <clears throat> Obviously, the community's grown at like an insane speed. Um, and I think that the representation at the city level clearly doesn't represent the growth being that no one on this council lives in the preserve. So maybe you should all think about that when you're thinking about how you change things in the community is that nobody in the community is taking any people's job. I'm not taking anybody's <laughs> job, you're crazy. I wear a tracksuit, good to see you. Um, <laughs> uh, I did meet with Karen and Mark a couple weeks ago. They were great to spend some time with me. I think the city council does care I know that it's made up of public servants. I don't know if you're a professional politician. I'm not aware of you yet, but you seem like you've seen some years, so that's good. How long have you been with Chino? Since uh, 1973. My man. All right. So, yeah, since it was a lot, lot different. So, clearly, business interests are dominating uh, raising family interests. We complain a lot about a lot of the small issues in our community, but I don't think some of us realize that this is an avalanche that will not stop because systemic problems have been put into place that are going to continue to cascade small problems. You can't solve problems in a school that is 30% over capacity. The problems will keep coming faster than you can solve them. And I think that goes the same for this community. We can't solve any of these problems if we keep building at the pace we're building. Like we couldn't even keep up with from going from, you know, the, the Mill Creek little block we had to now the expanded block we have now. It's been a disaster. If we add two and a half times more people, I mean, <laughs> whoa. So I'm here to represent for any of my citizen friends, I rent, I, I sell money through the Chase app to a man in China, uh, but I know there are people in this community that have put their entire nest eggs, their entire future in, uh, in this community, and I, I'm here to speak out for them um, because they're really gonna take the brunt of it. If, if you've lived in Southern California, and I've spent time all over Southern California, we've all seen neighborhoods that you could see used to be nice. These track developments, time and time again, you're like, I bet you this was a pretty sweet place one time. And then it's just terrible. And I believe the PD caught a nice meth dealer in our neighborhood today too, right? So, um, you know, uh, <laughs> there, needs to be, there needs to be changes at, at the systemic level and I don't, I don't, I'm not sitting here pointing fingers. I'm just saying whoever's the one letting the guys that don't live here and have all the interest in those warehouses and you're putting those people on top of the people that actually live here and put the future of their children's education here, rethink that uh, because it's, it's an issue. Um, and I hope that, uh, I hope it's one we can get past. So uh, bless you all. Merry Christmas. Happy belated Hanukkah. Voting, by the way. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Miller. Yes, yes, sir. And Sarah McGlarty. All right. Good evening, uh, City of Chino Council members. Um, I'm just here to put a face behind my email. Thank you, uh, um, Council Member Flores, for responding to me. Um, I wrote this quickly at work one day during the rain, the other, uh, last week, I think, 
Um, and I'm just going to go ahead and read it in case any of you missed it. Um, good afternoon. I'm emailing you regarding the street closures and flooding in the preserve. We are preserve residents for 15 years, watching Ontario Eastville and Chino Hills build streets before they build communities seems to be common sense to me. As a kid, I remember the Grand Avenue fence that separated Diamond Bar and Chino Hills. I remember it being closed for a very long time after the road was complete. The city of Diamond Bar was not equipped for Chino Hills to use Grand Avenue as a major road. But when they were, then it finally opened. Why does Chino not take the same kind of care for their residents? Why can all the cities east of us use Pine, Kimball, Merrill as major roads when our, roads when our roads are farm roads? You guys did a great job getting big pop-ups and lots of trucks to our area of the city. I'm guessing our roads are not built to withstand these big rigs. I can see it in the few streets that we do have. The Kimball project has been or will be over six months. Why are they not working overnight on, on the weekends to complete this? Why is it still shut down? The residents of the preserve are angry. We've been patient, we've been understanding, but this has gone ignored for too long. My husband works in the industry and he's shocked at the timeline for this project. This morning I left for work. I wasn't sure if I would be able to get home that evening. When you leave for work in the morning, do you wonder daily if you will make it home safely? We pay high taxes out in the preserve and you have us living as if we are a third world country. I invite you to travel down to our community on a rainy day or any morning or evening. You should really witness what you oversee. It's sad that people must take so much time out of our busy schedules to send emails to you guys. You guys have jobs just like the rest of us and it would be nice if people would do theirs. Stop putting band-aids on things and help our communities become a functional part of Chino. Thank you for your time and reading this and um, I hope you all get home safely tonight. Thanks. Thank you. <coughs> and we have Lori Rodriguez. Good evening and uh, thank you for taking my comments. I'd like to echo um, the sentiments of Mr. Michaels about the uh, glaring problem, the inverse relationship between the quality, the diminishing quality of life and the, um, the increase in the building, the, the, uh, the warehouses. Um, it's uh, sort of what I would kind of uh, liken it to living in a, um, all the warehouses, I mean, they change from, the, the profile changes from one week to another. It's like living in a, in, in, in a, in a Cold War type of a, an environment, just nothing but concrete structures. Um, but I just wanted to make uh, that note. But uh, on a more sour note, quite literally, is the dairy, that deplorable dairy, probably the last the last dairy in Chino. And uh, we live in Ground Zero. We live on the corner of West Preserve Loop and Horizon Street, just right across the street from it. And uh, we've been here now about uh, two years from the beginning of December. We've moved from Burbank. And I thought, oh, this can't, this, this couldn't quite possibly um, last much longer. And if this was an Instagram caption, we would be like, you can't make this blank up, okay, because you can smell it all day long. We have written letters to the city of Chino. I have called the San Bernardino County Health Department. We've called Vector Control. Um, I have called the California Dairy Association, the Department of Agriculture, and still there is nothing that's done. Um, really, I am just... I don't know what else to say. I think I have, we have a better chance of getting hit by an asteroid. So, you know, that being said, I should step aside and hope that one hits that dairy because it's going nowhere. And I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that it has a business license because it's operating in Chino. So somebody needs to read these emails or answer the phone calls, the voicemails, and send some type of an inspector there to see. I think that... Um, the deplorable conditions of the of this dairy, and like I said, we live right across the street from it. With the open sewage, um, the noise every night, the trash, you know, the the, the parties, um, that uh, something that something needs to be done. And um, are they they must be in violation of something? I, I I'm I'm certain. Um, that's all I can say. I. I don't know what else to say besides please have somebody look into this because there have been fights over there there's open sewage there is just trash and it's it, i mean saying it's tatty is is just you know that's being very generous it is absolutely sickening and i would not want anybody any one of you four to have to sit in a really nice house across the street from it and look at it just they've got about 20 year old used construction fencing 
And that's the primary problem is the health aspect of it. And that, of course, that's just, you know, they're the prime mover, and that's M-O-O-V-E-R to all the other secondary and tertiary problems like the flies. I know I've, I've been around cows before in other countries and other cities, um, but this is absolutely just really horrible. I think we have a fly problem in the immediate area much longer than we need to have, and it's all because of that dairy. So I would just implore you to please look into this. Send somebody out. I don't know. Uh, whose responsibility it is or what department overlooks this, but that's, that really, really does diminish the quality of life, especially when you're living, you know, the children going to school, um, and especially they're going to start building there. And I honestly don't know how they've sold the amount of houses that they've sold right there across from the school with those flies. But anyway, thank you so much for listening, and happy holidays to you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, this time, uh, I'd like to ask... Uh, the City Manager, if you'd like to address the audience. Thank you, Council. And I also want to thank the, the, the public for their comments, and many of you sent emails directly to me, and, and I appreciate that. I think there's two primary issues, certainly the Kimball Avenue, and I apologize to you all. Um, that certainly uh, wasn't completed on time as planned. Um, no matter really what I say as far as um, the uh, what has caused those delays? It's I think the only thing really to solve it is to complete that. As far as the to complete that project and to open up that road. Um, right now uh, we're working with the developer just so everybody understands uh, when the preserve was created in 2013 and when we annexed that. Uh, the council at that time and and all these council members up here had nothing to do with that. Just so you're aware. Um, but uh, it was uh, the council made it abundantly clear that um, the preserve was going to be um, driven by the development community um, and that the city as a whole wasn't going to necessarily subsidize that project. And so it's under that realizing that we're working with all these different developers and ownership down in the preserve, also ownership. Uh, we can't just go and plow roads. We, ne we need to uh, gain ownership. Uh, in fact, this council uh, exercised the first time in its history um, it, when the preserve was constructed. We actually entered an eminent domain and, to get a court order, uh, but that took a three-year process and was very expensive. But we have to go through that process because, you, you know, as an agency, we shouldn't have the ability to just take your land. There should be a process by doing so. Um, as far as us having to acquire additional land, um, there's, there's some portions on the south side of Bickmore that we need to acquire. Um, we also have to acquire some uh, property on, on Pine Avenue. And so I, I understand and appreciate your frustration, but I just can't legally go on somebody's land and, and build a road. So we're in the process of working on that. Um, as far as Kimball Avenue and, and timing, um, we're looking, hopefully, to, to open that road up by February, uh, if not sooner. Um, but we want to be realistic with our time frame. As it relates to the reference on the county improvement, the county, the airport has a certain amount of drainage that crosses Kimball. Um, and it's historically has done that. We have to convey that water underneath the road. We've been working with the county, particularly the airport, for more than six years to get that accomplished. Um, and they're operating kind of independent of this project. So we're trying to coordinate with them. Um, there's utilities that are in the ground that need to be moved. In fact, there was a water line that was constructed in 2005 that uh, didn't show up on the, the as-built. And so when we dug it up, we found the, this water line. So now we have to move the utilities. That includes gas and, and uh, electricity. But long story short, the goal is to have... Kimball completed uh, by February. There was a reference made um, uh, that the final completion will be in May, and that's because the pipes have been ordered to convey that, but we will open that road up by February, um, and once that pipe is delivered, we will then coordinate the installation of uh, that pipeline, but we will not close Kimball to do so. Um, as far as the, the second issue is flooding, um, I was, I've been here 10 years and I was here in, uh, 
about three years ago when we had a lot of the flooding. There's been some significant improvements that have been made. Um, uh, Merrill, if you recall, um, particularly at Grove Avenue, we would always lose Merrill during a rain event. And since then, uh, all that water is now conveyed under Merrill. And Merrill will be ultimately widened um, to two lanes in each direction, and we actually have the funding to complete that. Um, Pine Avenue is another area that we're looking at. Um, we haven't, uh, fortunately, we haven't had to close Pine Avenue. Um, but a lot of the flooding that occurred um, last week was a lot of the debris that came down, uh, particularly from the northern, as everybody's aware, the, the, all the water comes from the foothill communities and it all channels down to Chino, to the Prado Basin. Uh, we found a lot of debris. Uh, we actually, I had staff I, on, the, on when it was raining, uh, Council Member Comstock and I actually went down there and our staff was already out there um, clearing uh, a lot of the debris. And when I say debris, it's trash. It also includes tumbleweeds and, and other uh, vegetation growth that's coming from the north. So in preparation, um, we're, our folks are out there now, and they'll be out there tomorrow. We're clearing that debris, and we're actually going above and beyond our city limits because the cities adjacent to us aren't clearing that material. Um, we're also, particularly at Bickmore and uh, Euclid, uh, we're kind of clearing, trying to make some more area for, for the water to convey underneath that road. Um, signs and barricades and equipment are going to be stationed out down in the preserve. Um, I'll have six to eight public works individuals that will be stationed down in the preserve during this time. And also majority of my traffic division in the police department um, will be down in uh, the preserve. Flooding is not just an issue down in the preserve, although we do see it. We also had some street closures in the northern part of the city. The city of Chino is relatively flat. and The, the, the main thing that conveys the majority of the water, it's, it's actually our streets, the curb and gutter. And to show you, if you were to drive in the northern part of the city, we have some curbs that are about you know, 12 to 18 inches tall. And that's because of the flatness of the city. And that was what was used to convey the water down south, down to Prado. Um, so anyway, we're, we're preparing for uh, the events tomorrow. Um, I don't want to discount any of the testimony that was here today. Our goal as, a, as, as staff is to complete these projects. Um, and they're significant projects. Um, and, but we, we, we hope to get those done, and, and I don't want to provide excuses. I just want to get them done. Okay. Uh, I'll save my comments towards the end, but is there any other council members who would like to make any comments regarding the preserve? I have a, I have a, quite, a, I have a quite a few. Okay. Oh. I first want to thank the preserve residents for coming here tonight and expressing their frustration. Uh, as many of you know, I've, I've worked in the city for a long time. Uh, I was one of your former directors of public safety, so I'm aware of what happens when we get a significant rain event down to the south side of the preserve. Hind hindsight is, is always 2020. I think that when the preserve was still a working dairy area before the Ag Preserve was broken up and we decided to build down there. I think this council uh, that was seated at that time really believed in the plan that the development of the preserve could probably pay for itself as it went along the way. But now, and that for me happened when I was a 20-year-old 20, 20 police cadet working here and they were telling us we were going to put a community down there including shopping centers and here we are fast forward you know, 25 or actually not that not, I wasn't that young but actually fast forward 25 years later and we have residents down there we have about 17,000 residents down there and one of the things I, I talked about uh, during my campaign was hey I understand what you guys are expecting down here what we as a city told we were going to build down here and I think at one point when I start talking about hindsight and fast forward 25 years later you say to yourself well perhaps this just isn't working any longer. So I don't know I don't know what the answer to that is, but I would like for this council to tonight perhaps discuss you know the strategy that we have employed over the past 20, 25 years. I do think it's frustrating for residents down there for us to keep doing the same thing when the city manager and I went down there, there's, there's a lot of flooding 
And I remember, I, you know, I said to him and, th and to myself, hey, how long, how long do we keep doing this? How long does this keep happening? While there have been some improvements down there that the city manager explained tonight, they're certainly not significant enough to not cause some of our residents down there concern when it rains. I mean, every member of this council now has either family members or friends that live in the preserve, and we hear these complaints. And one of the things I think this council talked about is, hey, we need to start thinking about you know, how we change that. It's, it's frustrating that, that the residents of this portion of our community don't have one street yet built to its maximum you know, full uh, you know, capacity. And that's to, again, it's just part of a strategy that this city adopted, and I'm not sure, you know, I, I mean, I don't think anybody, anybody that's sitting in this room tonight can say, hey, you know, perhaps it's you know, smart for us to just continue down that path. It's also frightening for people when it rains to wonder whether or not they can get back inside their community. And, and um, I understand that. Um, you know, for a long time, when I was still working at the police department, I, I received your emails. And if I do get them, I still try to respond to them today and, and be responsive to you and, and be compassionate about your concern about getting in and out of there. Um, it's also part of the reason I ran, uh, as I stated earlier. It's also not fair to our employees. Um, when I pass some of our employees out there, the public works employees and the police officers who are working out there, you know, vigorously trying to keep our roads open and passable for you, I want to compliment them. Year after year, they go out there. I just, I dreaded when I was still working at the police department a, a significant rain event. I know what that means to not just the, the PD employees, but our public works staff and other people that they are going to have to shift into to action in order to, to help our residents down there. So not just is it frustrating them, it's frustrating to our employees as well. Um, I'd, I'd like for that to be a discussion of, with the council tonight, Mayor Pertim, about maybe asking our staff to look at, you know, is there a way that we can fund that? Is there a way we can start, you know, looking at, you know, building our streets in a different way, even just a couple of them? I will say from my knowledge and my experience, I know that Merrill and Pine are completely different issues than when you talk about Big Warren Kimball. Um, because of the entities involved, the right of way and some different things, all the people involved, those are completely different challenges than what we face on Kimball and Bick Moore. I'm sure the city manager would agree with that. I was, you know, again, a, a part of some of that, you know, in my one year here, I was a part of some of the decision making in order to advance even some, some right of way on Pine Avenue because it has to happen. Um, we've also been a part of, you know, you know getting the development agreement um, secure between, you know, significant landowners down there in order to, for us to move forward with even you know, moving the, the, the dirt to, to deliver some of your shopping and some, some of the other things. But your shopping is probably, I mean, just mostly desirable. I know, I know it's, you know, we should be getting the reciprocating benefit. I've talked to people about this coming into East Feller passing through that area so that they're shopping in our areas. But conversely speaking, you know, you know like, you know, like we do with Chino Hills, some people come in from Chino Hills, but we also go there. So, but right now we're not getting any of that. So there is a development agreement with, with the dairy there. Hopefully that will inspire those property owners to, to develop that area so that we can get you know, the shopping and, and um, the storm rain there. In regards to the dairy, one of the most frustrating things about our, for our residents down there, I'm sure a lot of people didn't, don't, don't know that when they move in there, is we do have a right to farm ordinance here in Chino. Um, but again, hopefully with now though that landowner having a, the development agreement secured, it will inspire them to um, maybe make some, you know, future decisions about um, uh, that, dairy, that dairy leaving sooner rather than later now with their development agreement in place. And Matt, please correct me if, if I'm wrong on any of these things. No, you're absolutely correct. Um, but that, that, that development agreement will be huge in hopefully those, those landowners wanting to now develop that area versus keep renting it to the dairyman that's that's operating it. Matt, I would ask if if that dairy is um, we have uh, we have working relationships with those landowners. I would ask that we reach out to them and make sure that that's being maintained the proper way. Um, I don't want to see our, you know. I think we have a responsibility to just reach out to some of those 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 vector control you know fencing around it um, you know and, and just doing our best you know to 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 keep it in, in the best state possible while it's still operating down there until it does develop. So I would ask some of our staff to, to look into that. Um, there was a suggestion of Kimball being open, you know, brought forward to me as, as a one, you know, one way in, one way out. 
that was shared with the city manager, not just by you as residents, but also by me. And I'm, I'm hoping that we can deliver on that for the residents in the meantime. Last thing I'd like to comment on is, is, is the school. I've sat and spoke with a lot of residents about the school. Um, I have been advocating for, this, for the second school down there for quite some time, but I have also explained, been very upfront with residents of, that we don't have any control over what the school district does, but I have been a strong voice and advocate for the, for the development of Preserve 2. And um, this, the school district has, is, is, has entered into a purchase agreement with Lewis about that, and they have actually published a timeline which they hope to deliver on that second school in the preserve, which is, 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 is needed. It's been needed for a few years. Uh, the school is you know, over capacity, and um, hopefully the school district will deliver on that. And, but I, as a member of this council, will continue to advocate for the, for the construction of that second school. Um, regardless of you know, what area or you know, where I sit on the council. Um, and I even told people, hey, I would help advocate for that school, you know, whether or not I was a member of the council or not. And there's some people here that know that I, that I said that. Uh, that being said, I would just, I think I would say that I just want to see us treat our friends and our neighbors down there like you know, like they're a part of our community and like we care about them. Um, I'm not saying that people in the past haven't, but I can see their frustration. I mean, even in my conversations with the city manager, he has said, hey, their complaints are legitimate down there. This has become an extremely frustrating situation in this process. And I'm just committed to, you know, to helping and along with the staff. I know the staff wants to help. I know they want to deliver on these projects. And maybe it's time for us to, to consider doing it a different way. That concludes my comments, thank you. Council Member Flores. Hi, good evening everyone. Um, just a couple of things, um, as I mentioned in an email sent, I sent recently, um, I, I completely understand where you guys are coming from. Um, many of you may or may not know, but I lived down there in the preserve for about four years. Uh, my family still lives down there in the preserve. Um, last week, um, when, you know, when, when they, Almost chaos was happening down there. My mother herself was, you know, late 40, 45 minutes to um, to work. Um, she she works in L.A. My sister goes to school in Chino Hills. Um, so I, I completely understand where you guys are coming from. Um, that day, I, I, I do remember um, seeing on Facebook that our, our, our city manager and council councilwoman uh, Karen Comstock were down there, and I was just delighted to see that. Um, we've had plenty of conversations um, regarding Kimball Avenue. Um, with our city manager, I know I've spoken to members on the council regarding, hey, um, you know, this is an issue. But um, earlier today, in one in somebody's comments, I I heard that there was this this um, this idea of, hey, it's right now. It just seems like there's politicians, staff, and residents, um, and I, I completely hear where you guys are coming from. Um, but I think with this new council, and I think you know, about a year ago when um, Councilwoman Comstock and I, uh, you know. Join the council. Um, that was a um, uh, we were trying to change that vision, and I can assure you guys that this council. Um, I, I feel that we put ourselves, you know, last on that totem pole, and the residents do come first. And I completely understand what Kimball being shut down. It may not seem like that, um, but there, there, that for myself and for the council, I, that, that that is the vision. Residents do come first. Um, I believe it was Lori, Ms. Rodriguez, you mentioned that you live on West Preserve. Um, that's, that's where I live, that's where my parents live right now. So the dairy across the street, um, the parties, I remember all the, all the parties that are being thrown there and um, I, I completely understand when you talk about deplorable, it's, it's becoming deplorable as you mentioned. Um, and just a few minutes ago, I liked Karen, um, excuse me, Councilwoman Comstock's suggestions, hey, City Manager, what can we do? You know, can we, can we go in there and see? We do have a working relationship with those property owners Right, there has to be some sort of solution there, at least some answers, right? Maybe there's not solutions, but um, when there's questions, there has to be answers, and what are those answers? Um, I guess my last comment I would mention is if we do have, I would entertain that conversation um, Councilwoman Comstock mentioned tonight. Um, what, what, what can we do? What can we say? Or what, you know, what can we talk about tonight to, um, I guess, uh, move forward in a different direction? Um, as mentioned, there, what, what's been done in the past may have worked at the time, but it's a new age, it's a new day, and the same issues are still here. You know, there has to be some sort of, um, um, there has to be another route. And, and um, 
I'm here to entertain that. I mean, if we got to talk about it, let's talk about it. Um, but that kind of concludes my comments, and um, I'm I'm here completely in support <coughs> of our residents down in the preserve. And um, again, I I, I I I don't know where where you guys are the voice, and we're here to represent that voice. So you know, let, let's let our voices be heard. Councilman uh, Pocock. Oh, just a couple things. Um, in my past meetings with the city manager, uh, I. I can hear his concern and uh, his, his angst over what's going on down there, and especially traffic related, and uh, he is committed. I mean, he's committed to solving this problem. It won't, it won't happen overnight, but uh, I can tell you that uh, our city manager is, is going to straighten this out. And I think uh, city council will have to, have to address it and commit, commit ourselves to uh, Solving the problems and and seeing that uh, down the road this uh, these issues don't don't happen anymore. Uh, that's the only thing we can do is just eliminate them and work it out in advance. That's the end of my comments. Okay. And I just uh, I want to first of all I want to thank everybody from the preserve that came. It's extremely powerful to have you guys come down here and actually tell us your frustration. I've seen it on social media, but a lot of times. People think, well, that's just social media. But you actually coming down here telling us your frustration is really impactful, not just on the city council itself, but also on the city staff. So I want to thank you for taking the time to come out here, especially during the holidays, to come up here and let us know where your frustration is. Um, I, too, have uh, my ex-wife and my kids. They live in the preserve. Uh, they live off of festivals. I saw one of you live on festivals, so they're your neighbors. I also have to pick up my son sometimes and I have to drive him to Anaheim because that's where he goes to high school. Uh, so I know the frustration that you have. I know how early we have to leave. And I know it not only, it used to only be the, the problem was it would bottleneck on the 71 and the 91, but now it bottlenecks all the way through the preserve. So I understand your frustration. Some of the historical things that have been, that have been talked about here is the previous council that was here in place for about 20 years decided when the preserve was being developed that it, the roads were going to be paid for by development and the developers were going to build the roads. Well, as a leader in, in different, a different organization, I can tell you that you can look at it, something that's in place, and then when you realize that it's not working, then it's time to change it. So I've had conversations with the city manager and I've told him, hey, I think it's time that we stop allowing the developers to develop our streets down there and it's time that we as a city develop our own streets that we take these as, as projects ourselves, that we fund them, and then that we utilize the money that's in development that they pay in fees, and then we reimburse ourselves. Because at least that way, we, as a city, have control of the timelines, and we hold people responsible, as opposed to going to a developer and saying, hey, when are you going to get this done? And then what ends up happening is if they don't get it done, they're not hearing the frustrations from the citizens. You know, and they really, at some point, sometimes they just don't care. You know, it's, it's hard to say that. But, I mean, we've seen some of these projects take longer than, than they should. And the only really alternative to believe is that there's going to be some delays, but the reality is they're not responsible to you guys, and we are. So the city manager, when I've had those conversations with him, he's, he's, he's agreed that that's, that's probably the best way that we're going to move forward. Um, so I would, I don't know how we do it, Fred. Do we, do we put in a motion to say, hey, you know, I think now we need to start looking at, at projects down there in the preserve as far as development of roads. That's something that's a capital improvement project taken on by the city and then looked at potential reimbursement from the developers later or, or how we would do that to give a direction to the city staff to start moving in that direction. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor Pro Tem. I know that this is not on the agenda, so there have been a lot of comments presented to the city council, so I know um, each of you have provided uh, brief responses to each of those uh, various comments, and that's appropriate. Now, um, to, to try to take some action or, or see something implemented, my suggestion is that you simply direct staff to put uh, an item on your future agenda uh, for a discussion about, um, you know, whatever topics. I, like I said, there were a lot of issues raised, but if it's to uh, maybe change that policy on uh, deferring to developers to uh, implement the infrastructure, uh, the construction of the infrastructure. 
that could be the topic of discussion and whatever else you'd like to direct staff to, to include in that agenda. Would we have to make that motion and then vote on it, or would we just it, make a suggestion? To it, it's just a suggestion. Unless there's a majority objection, then your staff would come back with, with that item. Do I have any objection to that? No. And I would direct staff to, to come up with a plan to utilize any of the road improvements or any of the road construction that we have down in the preserve and, and take those as capital improvement projects and, and look towards afterwards being reimbursed by the developers as opposed to having the developers develop those roads. I have a question, Mark. Go ahead. And I know we have some of that ARPA money is, you know, um, that we haven't talked about how we're going to spend spend that or commit that yet. You know, it, it, you know, I would like for us to also take a look at that. Maybe be, you know, a, a good um, a good idea to use some of that money if, if we need it for some of that road, some, for some of that construction. I don't know if that's an exp uh, a, a allowable allocation of it, but. Yeah, so just so folk, when they refer to ARPA money, that was uh, uh, money that was provided by the federal government. Uh, the city received roughly $14 million. There's basically five criteria on how to use that. Uh, one of the criteria was infrastructure, and that's limited to water, storm drains, uh, I'm sorry, water, sewer, and broadband. So the federal, it's only those three categories. So it's water, sewer, or broadband. Okay, thank you. Okay, and, and once again, I... I I hear your frustration. I, I apologize uh, for the things that you've been going through down there. I do hear it from my, my kids as well, as well as Mike's wife. We're definitely going to start moving in the direction. We, we do have a different council up here. Um, I ran three years ago on the fact that we didn't have anything but warehouses down there or anywhere to eat for the residents. Um, we're just starting to hopefully break ground next year to get you guys a, a shopping center. It, uh, it's been a long process, but I think with the people that we have in place now, I think things are going to start happening for you folks down there. Um, <clears throat> it's a long time coming. You definitely needed some changes down there. But I think you got, uh, you got people that ran on platforms here that were community first, development second. So we do want the houses developed. We do want communities built. But I think we need to look at you know, slowing down the construction of the large warehouses and, and let's get some infrastructure and some roads and, and some things that you guys need, some shopping centers. Look at those things first before we start continuing to move in a, in a direction that we can't uh, reverse ourselves. But uh, I think you, you got people here that that ran and knocked on doors and and did what they needed to do to, to talk to people and to get the, and get the community's input. And um, that's the majority of your council now. Uh, Previously, they, they ran unopposed most of the time. So I'm not saying that they didn't, uh, you know, it wasn't as developed as it is now. The problems that, that we have now weren't as big as they were back then. But now we're, we're seeing this. You, you've got a lot of houses down there. I think we have something like 17,000 residents down there. And you guys are one of the biggest communities that we have. But now we need to start uh, stepping up as a council and providing you guys some services that you guys need. Because you're right, you do pay high sales tax. I, I know the sales tax you guys pay because I pay something similar to that in College Park. So I know that I would be upset if I, I didn't have those type of services and I was paying the kind of money that I'm paying currently. So I do feel what you guys are going through. Um, as far as the dairies, I, I can tell you prior to moving to College Park, I lived uh, directly behind the dairy and uh, my back wall was the dairy. But I will have to say that that man kept that dairy immaculate. There was, there was a truck that came through that took all the manure out of the, the pins. And uh, sometimes you couldn't even smell it. And we were literally on the other side of the wall. Um, so I think it, it's important that we look to make sure that they're, they're meeting all the, the things that they need to meet to make sure that, that they're cleaning those, bin, those pins when they need to be cleaned. And that uh, obviously the water sitting there um, that, that can cause some, some obviously, obviously some awful smell, but th there's some times that they have to rotate that through. But I think we need to make sure that they're adhering to that. I know that they're a big uh, landowner in the city, but I, I think that we have a good relationship with those owners. I think they, that they would be cooperative. I think it's just a matter of, of us going out there as a city staff, talking to them and expressing the frustration of the community. But again, I, I thank you guys for coming out here. I appreciate your comments. And uh, I'm going to end with just... We hear you. Um, you know, next year will be a, another year, and we'll look at this. And uh, if we're not any better than we were this year, then uh, 
we know that we, we're not going in the right direction, but I, I think we're going to do better this year. So I anticipate that we're, you're going to have some better things going on there. And uh, at least I'm going to hold myself to that, that I provide a better product for you guys to be living down there in a better community. And that's all I have. OK. Uh, and so now I, I believe we take a, we look at the consent calendar other, other, than, other than the two items that have been pulled. Is there any other member of the public that would like to pull any additional items from the consent calendar? Mayor Pertam, um, my uh, voting function is not working here. Uh, uh, we're going to have to probably take a voice vote when we do it. Okay. So can I take a, a vote on the remainder of the balance of the consent calendar? Yeah, I'll make a motion. Do I have a second? I'll second that. You want to roll call, Angela? Yes. Councilmember Flores? Yes. Okay. Councilmember Pocock? Yes. Okay. Councilmember Comstock? Yes. Okay. Mayor Pro Tem Lucio? Yes. Motion carried, four with one absent. City Manager, I know that we pulled uh, item number eight, um, but are we ready to move on with number, item number nine? We are? Okay, I'd like to call uh, Mr. Stubby Barr to the podium. Um, and just a clarification, this is no longer a public hearing item, so the comments don't become part of the public hearing record, but uh, obviously the council can accept comments. Yes, sir. Sorry, I'm, I'm a little weak. Um, please bear with me. Uh, you didn't see me so try to raise my hand back there. Um, but I would like to do a follow-up comment on what just occurred. I want to thank uh, Fred for pointing out the, um, the Brown Act requirements. Um, I don't think anybody's going to demand a cease and uh, cure and correct letter on what just happened. Um, but uh, when you know of an issue that's going to be coming. You need to get hold of staff. There needs to be a procedure. Most, most city councils have it on their regular agenda to add something to the agenda so that you can have a lengthy comment and discussion and you can make, take action on it. Um, what we just did uh, was great, don't get me wrong, but it actually is a violation of the Brown Act. You can't have a discussion and make determinations on something that's not posted on the agenda. And it shouldn't be that hard to add something to the agenda even last moment when it's something like this. This, this, is, this is great. I think this is the first time I've ever seen this type of interaction between the council and, and the residents. And it seems genuine, which is unusual, as you guys know from the history. So thank you. Thank you for that comment. Um, were you able to get it up? Oh, that won't work. Okay. All right, I'm going to wing this, and I'll try to have you. Um, I don't know how we can do this. You don't. You don't have the controller. You guys need to get that software fixed. I have a presentation for you, but it's this is going to be very awkward. Uh, I noticed that you're not timing anyone tonight, so um, maybe it won't be quite as bad. Um, can you go ahead and and tack me forward one more? So this is preserve issue, and I'm, I'm not going to be able to do it the way I want to do it, so I'm just going to talk to you. <sighs> a lot of the issues that the people just talked about um, are the same thing that result in what's happening right here. We have a preserve amendment that does a drastic change, a major change. If it's a minor, minor change, it's of a minor amendment, you guys never see it. Administratively, it's done. The only time you see... Um, action on an amendment of a, the general plan or a specific plan, it's a major thing. It's built right into the code. If you read the administrative section of the, of the specific plan for the preserve, it states that right in it. <clears throat> so the information that you were given, the information that the public received, 
on this was incomplete. So you were not only misinformed, but you were underinformed. I sent comments to planning, which, um, as you see on there, uh, go ahead and click a couple of times. There you go. Um, and they stated that, the, oh, I missed the deadline. Planning Commission is an open and public meeting. The Brown Act applies. The, the comment period doesn't end until the item is finalized. So, so my comments are actually on the record. The same comments that I gave to planning, you guys received in that three-page email last week when I could not make it here. I'm sorry. I, was, I couldn't move last week. Um, <clears throat> so uh, jump down to, please. There we go. OK, so what we have is we have a series of shared use paths in a preserve. And this is a quality of life issue to the maximum. Staff is telling you here that the intent of, that is written in the, to, in the preserve is wrong. They're interpreting it as completely being 180 degrees opposite of what it is. Their justification for removing 30 miles of shared use paths, and I think you all know what a shared use path is, it's not a bicycle lane. It's classified under the Bicycle Transportation Act of 1993 as a bike lane. But it is a path where pedestrians using any type of human-powered locomotion, any type, even battery-assisted, like the people that have the little, um, they call them LVF, uh, low-force uh, low motors uh, on the skateboards, those are all considered human-powered. This is, that's what these are. They are recreational parks. They're linear parks. And it's designed to connect the entire community. So it becomes a network of, of transportation without hopping in your car and without making your kids ride their bicycles on the street. Those of you who go to Ayala Park know you can look at the shared use path there. It's used very heavily, not so much since the rain. <laughs> but you see entire families there. You see the dad walking the dog and the mom pushing the stroller and kids on bikes and people on roller skates and dribbling balls and all as a group because they could do it because it's a shared use path. When you take away these shared use paths, you take away the intent of these recreational trails, this network of trails that is supposed to connect to every single neighborhood and every single element of the, of the uh, community. So staff's comments, this is their report, says that the modification to the language allows for the flexibility needed resulting in the reclassification of the transit lane to a high priority transit corridor as further described below. Now, whoever wrote that obviously was not an English major. But what they're saying is that it is the bus lane, the, the trolley lane that's built into the preserve, which may never, ever actually be needed, that is telling them that they need to remove all the shared use paths. The bus lane, and, and we'll, we'll, we'll jump forward and I'll show you, the, the um, section they're talking about is two half-mile sections of roadway. That's it. Two half-mile sections of roadway. And what it consists of is they're taking the bus lane from the number two lane, and they're putting it in the number one lane, and they're converting the number two lane to a bike lane for a half mile on one side of the road and a half mile on the opposite side of the road. That's it. How you can use that to justify taking out 30 miles of shared use paths is beyond me. I have no, I, I can't comprehend any way to, to make the connection. <clears throat> Uh, one more down, Angela. The class two, I'm sorry, I, I don't have my pad, so I can't hardly read this. The class two on street bike lanes uh, eliminate the need for the class one shared use paths. That is a ridiculous statement. The people that use the bike lanes are airplane pilots. And the people that use the shared use path are n the normal. Uh, as ground mobile personnel. This is no different than saying 
we don't need the 15 freeway anymore because you can fly from Ontario to, New to Las Vegas. It's the same thing. It's two completely different classes. The guys that ride in the bike lanes on the street are serious bicyclists. You've seen them. They, they dress like bicyclists. They know what they're doing. They ride 75 miles and they don't think about it. They do not need the bike lane to use the street. Two of you are police officers, you know that, right? You can ride your bike on any street. The bike lane is just an amenity that's supposed to help separate it. There is no correlation between those users and little kids that are playing on their bicycles, people that are skating, practicing, family that's out for a walk, elderly people that may go out at, you know, in the evening for a stroll. That's the purpose of the shared use path, despite what staff told you on the Saras Regis project, that is exactly the definition of them that's in the streets and highways code. So removing them removes a huge quality of life component for the entire preserve. Um, can you just flip ahead and I'm gonna skip some of this stuff. Angela? One more. Okay, so this is the current um, specific plan, okay? So, and basically it describes the Paseo system, which is the open, uh, the open space system, as a network of trails and linear open space, linear open space. This is, it's designed as parks, long continuous parks, landscape on both sides, transportation and recreation facilities in the middle, um, that connect the major features of the preserve. This system is also a critical component of the preserve's mobility system, right? In that it accommodates walking, equestrian, and bicycling. Pretty straightforward. Click, please. One more. This is the change. Now, staff has given you a change log that supposedly has all the changes that were made in these documents, right? You have 265 pages. You don't know where the changes are. You have a change log. This change, one more click, please. They added the word can, and they also modified the word accommodate. They changed the tense of the verb accommodate and, and changed the entire meaning of it so that now it is optional as to whether these paseos need sidewalks, equestrian trails, or bicycle lanes, class one bicycle lanes. This isn't in your change log. You wouldn't have known about it unless you took the two documents and compared them side by side. Click, please. The bottom of that page, uh, I just pointed out that the, the Paseos and the shared use paths are publicly owned, right? They're owned by us as a city. These are not HOA items. They're not developer items. They're open to everybody. And then down below, if You'll click again, Angela. <clears throat> this sentence right here negates the entire argument that what staff is doing, their argument is stated in writing that what they are doing is interpreting the original intent of the specific plan. This is the specific plan. This sentence says that the Paseos must accommodate multipurpose trails um, Capable of, uh, I'm sorry, this thing's in my way. Capable of accommodating pedestrian and bicycle transit. That sentence alone tells you that these things are required, They're required in the specific plan. There's no doubt that's not an ambiguous statement. Uh, click, please. They changed this section also. Click. Um, and they put in, they must contain occasional class one bicycle facilities. Again, an English major, right? But uh, I don't even know what that means. But it changes the entire meaning of the, the plan. The plan was to force this, the developers to build this. And we have a master development uh, agreement, which is a contract, right? Um, Angela, go ahead. Skip this one. Skip this one. Those are just uh, connectivity things. Keep going. Okay, so one more. This is the transit loop in the preserve, 
Now I just used their, um, their graphic and overlaid it. So the graphic behind it is very poor, but I think you can see that that's an overlay of the major streets in the preserve, right? And it is to scale, by the way, even though it says it's not to scale, the scale is uh, one inch is 0.057 miles. So this loop, click please, intersects the uh, preserve road loop that goes around the community court, which is where the heart of this community is supposed to be. And what they told you in that meeting, I listened to the meeting, was that because of the, re the uh, realignment of the, or the change from transit lane to high, um, high priority lane, high priority um, transit, that they had to get rid of all this, the entire shared use path all the way around this. Click please. This is an overlay showing both. The green is the, the roadway. The, the magenta, which doesn't show up real well on this monitor, is the two areas where the roadway is shared by the bus lane and the, um, and the roadway. Click, please. So the roadway, as it's designed right now, the green area, which is approximately two miles, uh, it already has class two bike lanes. Contrary to what um, Dennis Rawls told you guys, there's already bike lanes there on both sides. The purple areas have a bike lane on the outside, but have the transit lane on the inside. So the, the, big, the big issue is what we talked about before. They need to restripe that one section, pick up the stripe, move it over, make it into a bike lane, connect the, the bike lanes that are already there. This has nothing to do, this is all on the roadway, has absolutely nothing to do with the shared use paths. Click please. And again. Bickmore, same thing. This is a continuation of that loop. I don't want to get into the whole loop, but Bickmore, the west section of Bickmore, has a shared use path. The east section has a transit lane and two bicycle lanes. It's already in place. It's already built. Now, they didn't stripe the street right, but it's built. Click, please. One more. My auto zoom isn't working. Huh? <laughs> so this is the new bicycle plan that's included in the new amend amended specific plan. You'll notice on here that there's four different things. Three of those, the blue, the red, the yellow, are bicycle related. They also included the green one, which is a uh, the, the Paseo system. However, they've removed bicycle lanes from the Paseo system. Click, please. So why did they include it on there? One more. It's because they wanted it to look like this drawing, which is the current drawing. Click one more time. All of those Paseos right there are bicycle facilities. They would be properly belong on a bicycle plan. They no longer belong on a bicycle plan. Click, please. One more. One more. So I took the liberty of using their overlay and just showing you what changes are being made because they just show you the final product. You don't see what's being changed, right? Here's what's being changed. First off, they're removing two miles of class two bike lanes in roadways, and they're not doing anything to replace them. Click, please. They're adding nearly six miles of sharrows. Remember our sharrows from the TDA3 project? So all of these streets are going to have the sharrows painted on the pavement and the sign stuck in the middle of the sidewalk, and that long strip in the middle is Main Street. Main Street they are going to be encouraging you to have your kids ride their bicycle in the traffic lane and there's angled parking on Main Street where the drivers have to back out into the traffic. Click, please. One more. So this is the entire um, shared use path system as was originally designed. The red is 28 miles of shared use paths that are being eliminated. The blue is the ones that they are keeping. Click, please. So you end up with this system. Now you look at this and it looks pretty backbone. Please consider that from Euclid to Hellman, 
is 2.31 miles. And from Kimball down to the bottom of Miramonte is almost four miles. So these do not connect the entire community. You're gonna have to get in your car and drive to one of these streets to use the transportation facility that was supposed to be designed to connect the entire community. Sorry I took so long, but this, this issue stems from the fact that some of these, like on Bickmore and parts of um, Pine, have been constructed as sidewalks when they were supposed to be constructed as, and you guys know that I've been hounding about that since 2014, okay? Um, I objected when you guys approved Saris Regis. We now have approved it. Guess what? We're going to have to go back now and fix those things because they are shared use paths. Dennis Rawls made a comment, a very odd comment, during the last meeting that he had talked to Wes, uh, Chief Simmons, and they weren't going to, they were going to allow people to ride bicycles on the sidewalk. That is a shared use path. It's the use of something that designates what it is. If you go to Home Depot and buy a garden shed, throw it up in your backyard, it's a garden shed. If you rent it out to a family, it's now a dwelling because someone's living there. It's the use of something that determines what it is. The vehicle code and the streets and highways code both define a shared use path as something that is usable by any pedestrian. Pedestrians include any type of human powered locomotion and bicycles, because bicycles are considered separate. There are actually companies that build, um, what do they call them, fixie bikes, where they're direct drive and they have no gears and they have no chain. Because in California, you can ride those anywhere because they're technically not a bicycle. They don't meet the legal definition of a bicycle. So it's not something that staff can just decide, oh, we're going to let people do it. You can pass an ordinance and allow people to ride bicycles on their sidewalk. Some cities have done it, and they have re they've regretted it because it's a tremendous liability. Whenever you have bicyclists and pedestrians on an area that's not designed properly, the pedestrian loses, just like the bicycle loses when there's an automobile accident. So please send this back. This is the second reading. Uh, I'm sure Mr. Galante is going to tell you that my comments don't count because it weren't received in time, and that's fine. If you want to go that route, uh, I'm willing at this point to mandate this. Nobody is standing up for these people in the preserve. No one sees this. They don't see this because it's not physically built. If all of these shared use paths have been built and then you went and ripped them out, you'd have 500 members here, right? But they don't know what it is because it's just a document and it's not explained properly. It's the same thing with Main Street. There's some issues with Main Street. I didn't even get into that. Um, that you're going to get some negative feedback from people in the preserve. And it's not what they were promised and it's not what was part of the original design and it's not what was part of the, it's not even part of the rendering that they did for the new design. They still kept the old elements in it. So thank you for the extended time. I really appreciate it. Um, this has absolutely nothing to do with accessibility. Gee, that's a, that's a new one, right, for me? But seriously, it's, we should all be concerned about this. This could make or break the quality of life for the preserve. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Barr. Uh, Dennis Rawls, would you like to address the comments made? Good evening, Mayor Pro Tem and City Council. Uh, tonight, second reading of the preserve, the changes, as I explained before, were really meant to be changes that built a community that is already existing, a community that helps interconnect everybody. Um, the open spaces, the Paseo system, there's a specific exhibit that outlines where those locations of all those facilities are. That exhibit did not change with the amendment. All of the Paseo system, all of the open space system that was originally envisioned in the preserve specific plan 
did not change. What I think we're cut up on is really that shared use path definition versus um, bike lanes and, and how those facilities are used. And what we really attempted to try to do was really better define and better include facilities that met everyone's needs in the preserve. Uh, streets that interconnected, uh, bike lanes that interconnected, pathways and trails that interconnected, uh, and all of that to really create a, a full system of multimodal transportation, active transportation, complete streets. There's probably a half dozen buzzwords. Uh, that was really what all these changes were intended to do, was to really create that entire system. Uh, and, and really doing that by uh, taking the right of way that we were always intending to build and modifying that and really purposing it so that it accomplishes those tasks. Uh, so, uh, you know, the, the open paseos that are along street, si uh, street sides, um, the, the wide uh, shared use paths that are being asked tonight to be uh, reclassified as, share as wide sidewalks still provide an opportunity for families to take their kids out and walk them down the community and interconnect with all the other trail systems uh, and facilities that are intended to be built in the preserve. Uh, what we did uh, was really try to build now a bicycle system for those who wish to use it and interconnect that with all of that and do that without changing very little uh, of the roadway sections. There are some sections that change and there's some uh, errors and omissions uh, on some of the graphics, um, but uh, really the intention was to build and, and design a community that they're already using and to further develop that into something that everyone in the preserve could be proud of. Um, so that, that was really what our intention was with that. Um, made a couple of notes. So the, the transit lane uh, is meant to connect on Bickmore to Euclid, uh, but it does loop as was shown. Um, so really that, that 14 feet of pavement, uh, you know, I, you know, in, in looking at what was proposed and, and working through that, it really felt a better use to make that a class two bike lane. Um, so although there are class two bike lanes included in other locations, uh, really those are, again, to de develop a system of uh, roadways with all the needs and with dedicated uh, roadway width uh, given to each of those uses. So now if people continue to still use um, the sidewalks as a class one facility, that's, I guess that's okay. What really concerns me is those points at the intersections. And I think that's where we're really, Mr. Barr and I are really butting heads. Uh, because I really want the public to be safe when they cross a road. And I don't think a 13 foot wide uh, ramp accomplishes that. Um, I have strong um, tra uh, safety concerns with how that design interacts with the roadway. But it's what's required by law when we do a shared use path. And those will continue to be built on every new intersection along Pine Avenue, Hellman Avenue, and uh, Kimball Avenue. Uh, so those, because there's, there wasn't enough roadway width to dedicate a safe class two bike lane. Otherwise, I, I would have recommended we did that there as well. Um, but what you've seen at, uh, along Hellman at Legacy, uh, there's a new one now at Pine and Meadow House. There's one coming up soon at Hellman and um, uh, Market. And all of the other intersections, um, the, the, the Kimball closure right now is gonna build two of them. Um, those roadways where these uh, wide sidewalks, they, the, the landscapers use them as ramps to, to get up onto the shared use path and maintain it. I just don't see that as a safe use of the facility. And so part of what drove at least my review of this and, and my uh, desire to provide a, a multi-use facility was to really help with uh, making these facilities safe and usable for everybody. So that was part of my driving uh, factor in reviewing it. It was why uh, I felt you know, comfortable with these changes and signed off on them. Um, and I'm happy to answer any other specific questions you have. Thank you. Any council members have any questions? So, 
So I guess I don't understand, Dennis. Are we are we elim eliminating bike you know, bike lane, or are we are we not? I, I don't understand how how that's being presented now tonight. I think uh, there was a section Mr. Barr showed about Rincon Meadows that was on that bike exhibit. That was an a, a, an error and omission. Uh, it's currently designed with, I believe, bike lanes. All right, now if it's not, it will be. Um, and the detailed cross sections that we went through show bike lanes on on that segment of road. There is a segment of market between the loop roads that was modified. Uh, that modification was brought on by the realignment of the school, the second school in the preserve, which will have parents picking up and dropping off kids along market. Um, because of that reason, we're going to need uh, that curb space for parents to stage. So having a class two bike lane doesn't make sense there anymore. So that, it, that was changed to a class three and was originally a class two. Uh, so that change. Um, I spoke earlier about, uh, in the last meeting, about Legacy Park being modified. That was, there was a segment of Legacy Park within the loop road. That's the only segment of road where the right of way changed uh, significantly. Uh, and that was really changed just to match the segments of Legacy Road outside of the loops. Uh, there was a thought originally in the plan that that segment of Legacy would stand out uh, because it's inside the community core. And as we're developing that south of Pine segment, uh, it just no longer makes sense to have that be any different than the rest of Legacy Park. Um, I'm trying to think if there's any other segments. There, there's certainly an inclusion of a lot of more class threes, and that's just more a designation, adding the sharrows, providing that additional level of visibility to the, the vehicles and the bicyclists who uh, we intend to use those segments. Main Street in particular is going to be, uh, is being designed as a downtown feel. So it's supposed to be low speeds, lower than 25. There'll be stops at every entrance and exit out of the, the, the upcoming shopping center. Um, there's actually some, um, uh, we're actually raising the inter intersections as a, a speed table um, to help with uh, speeds. So we're, with that angled parking, with all the traffic control as planned, uh, a class three bike lane makes sense there. Um, the, the sidewalks that will be along the side of it will be wide. They'll be inviting for people to walk up and down to peruse the, the shops they're envisioned to be along those, that corridor. And so uh, that's why a lot of that change along Main Street was, was really uh, developed into really making that more of a downtown feel um, for the preserve as it develops. Councilmember Flores. Um, <clears throat> for myself, I'm um, looking at the last council meeting when this item was talked about. Um, the the only confusion um, I guess I, I I still kind of sort of have right now is um, you know how how the um, how the second school and the preserve comes into play in all this. Um, I um, so I mean if that can you know. Can be I, I apologize. Yeah, I should have clarified more. So the original. Um, original way the school was laid out, it had more of a horizontal alignment um, that, that stretched towards Main Street and East Preserve Loop. Uh, that is being uh, redefined, and that school now will sit more vertically along East Preserve Loop between Market and Academy, uh, with the major access to that for students will be along Market and East Preserve Loop. That'll be where the, the access to the, the parking lots and the, uh, the staff parking is envisioned to go. Uh, so because of that, because we're going to have that pick up and drop off occur along market, and probably some on, as well along East Preserve Loop, although uh, the major uh, uh, pick up and drop off is envisioned to be along market, that class two bike lane along market uh, was thought to be probably not the best idea. Um, as we see that every school everywhere, every school everywhere, Pick up and drop off is a hassle. Um, finding that spot close enough to the school um, so that your kids can quickly get to your vehicle, get into the car, and you can move on uh, with your day is tough. And so uh, we're, there's a lot of forethought going into how that school um, sits, how that school inter interacts with our streets. Uh, and we're, we're already trying to plan for um, that congestion and, and help with that as best we can. And so by allowing for pick up and drop off along market 
uh, in lieu of having a class two bike lane really helps with uh, that situation. So now my follow up question would be if, you know, if this item, if this item does get sent back today, um, does that slow the school project down? I believe so, although I'm not the person to ask that. But my understanding is I, I believe it would. I have one more question. What? So, That's comes from. so what you're saying is that, um, I don't, that, that the map with, the, with the, the, the bike pass, the one that was submitted by our staff has errors and emissions on it that don't include stuff that's going to be built on there. Is that what you're saying? There's, there's a segment of Rincon Meadows that should have been shown as a class two bike lane that currently does not. Um, that was before too as well, uh, the, the old exhibit. It, it was not intended to that, to that to be that way. And currently, so yes. and currently it, it has uh, bike lanes, so it's already class two currently. Can you, um, Angela, can you show the map um, that shows the, the bicycle plan? No, none of these, I mean, most of these are creations that Stubby had put together. There, there's one go that's back. got, yeah, go back. <coughs> I can answer a few of these questions that you guys are bringing forward. If I wouldn't you open would allow me to. Mr. Mayor Pro Tem. I, I know that you've allowed additional time for the speaker to speak. I know your municipal code imposes a five minute uh, maximum time to speak. It's up to this council whether you want to have a back and forth, but that's not your this, this city's practice to allow uh, a speaker to speak more than once. Any objection to letting him speak more than once? Thank you. Keep going. Keep going. I'm going to start bringing my own monitor on. Next one. Next one back. Keep going. Keep going. Okay. No, no. That, that, this has well, it. it doesn't. Keep going. You see the zig? Yes, it does. See the zigzag um, offset there? That isn't, the, that isn't the right. section. The section is one lead over. It's at no, it's really Mill Creek. Is the old, this is the one that he's referring to. No, I think, I think you have them backwards because it offsets and goes around the retention basin. Oh, it Is it, is it both of them, Dennis? Is it both Rincon Meadows and what would be Mayhew? Is, yeah, so it's both of them, right? This is the one. This is the original plan. And it shows the red right here on Rincon Meadows. That, that was the original plan. It showed that road on there. If you go out there, it's got a bike, a bike route. It's class two. And, and so from. If you go to look at the new plan, it, was, it didn't have this dash line, which it should. The cross section for that road shows that it's going to be a class two. When you, uh, talk, so if, when you ask what's the error and emission, that's that's specifically it. It exists out there today, and we just didn't. It's not reflected on the map. But I, I believe it's important to point out that the elevations that were provided to the city council during the public hearing showed that that was to be the the the, uh, the bike lane. So. Just the uh, the map didn't reflect what the elevations demonstrated. I would like to comment on that. You guys didn't get but one elevation, and the elevation you got was the same one that the public received. It was the loop road. There are 45 elevations with changes. You guys saw one. You saw that one section that showed the 2016 road section and the 2021 proposed road section. The Rincon Meadows is not the 
was not the issue that I objected to with planning. It was at Mill Creek, or not, yeah, Mill Creek, which is the one that offsets. Mill Creek. Mill Creek. That was the one that they drew incorrectly. And as far as I know, it's still drawn incorrectly. I haven't gone back to look to see if somebody's changed it. But that, that's immaterial. The entire argument that they're making is that, you know, we can get rid of these class one lanes, but oh, we're going to put them in anyway. If that's the case, why was the language changed? And why were they omitted? Why weren't they just, why was the plan not just add, uh, make a change at, at the school for market, which by the way, um, does not uh, meet with the, the, the standards that have been issued for safe routes to schools. Right? The federal government's issues safe routes to schools. I think the police departments are familiar with that, right? About scheduling it. They require bike lanes and they encourage that the bike lanes be class one bike lanes for the very reason that they don't want the kids in the street with the cars that are picking up other kids. There's, there's always a way to work around it. Um, if you approve this, um, it is going to, you, you're not going to get these um, bike lanes, these shared use paths built correctly. The, the paths that Mr. Rawls was referring to on, um, I think there's one at, what is it, Meadow, Meadow View and um, Pine. There's one at um, Legacy and Hellman. They're still not built correctly. Now, this is the same gentleman that told you during Saris Regis that, oh, they're supposed to have the curb there because the curb lets people know there's an intersection. And then the next two they built, they built them with a full width ramp, which is actually required. Just so staff knows, uh, PROAG is finally going to be adopted in April after, what, 17 years? Um, which is gonna mandate that these things be built this way. There, there, there's no argument. In California, you're required to follow the Highway Design Manual. That's the Streets and Highways Code requires that they follow the safety requirements of the Highway Design Manual. The reason that Class 1 facilities have different safety requirements is because they're designed. The safety requirements are designed to make it safe for the pedestrian and the bicyclist and any other form of, mode of transportation without vehicles because vehicles are the problem. You can't do that on class two on street bike lanes. And the reason the landscapers drive onto these and they drive onto them all the time and block them, I've given you guys dozens of photos, has nothing to do with the ramps because they drive over the curb because there's no ramps there now. They're not supposed to be on there. Code requires that signage be installed at every intersection saying no vehicles allowed. That's the law. Streets and Highways Code and the MUTCD, but we don't follow it. And what you have is you have an ambiguous amendment that is gonna end up resulting in exactly what I told you. The developer is looking for a way not to fix this stuff and not to build it. Remember, this doesn't cost the city anything unless we accept something that's built wrong like we did at Saris Regis. And now we're on the hook to fix it. Any other comments? Um, <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, this has gone way past the five minute supposed limit we're supposed to have on these discussions. And this is not an open hearing, but it's turned into one. And I suggest that um, we reschedule this s subject, pull it off there, pull it off the docket and, and put it on for a future open hearing. And we can, uh, at that point, hash out all these items because whatever Mr. Barr is proposing or talking about, we can't do, take care of tonight anyway. So Correct. I suggest <clears throat> we, we uh, pull it off the docket and, and uh, reschedule it for a public hearing at la or, or agenda item at a later, ta later date. Fred? Um, yeah, uh, Mr. Mayor Pro Tem, just uh, so the city council is aware, this would require uh, restarting the public hearing, providing all the notice of the public hearing, um, and coordinating with the applicant. You know, there's an applicant uh, that submitted this uh, particular amendment request. So, 
Um, I, I know there was a comment about a potential delay of a school project, so just wa just wanted to let the council understand that there is a pretty significant effort to reopen and reschedule a public hearing to redo uh, the first reading of the ordinance. Uh, hearing that, it's, it's not what I had in mind, but uh, I, what I have in mind is uh, we we can go on here for hours and we can still not not settle anything and uh, it's still going to have to go back and or possible it's going to have to go back for edit. Go ahead, Fred. Can you say something else? Uh, yes, the, uh, the specific plan can also be initiated. Another future change may be initiated by the city to the extent some additional tweaks may be made. I'm not suggesting one way or another. I'm just saying uh, there are opportunities to make some future adjustments to the, to the extent you want to add some additional uh, elements to, to the specific plan in the future, or this council can proceed as, as suggested. Okay. So at this point, I'll, uh, I'll call for a recall, or at least, for, at least for a vote on sending it back and then reopening the hearing at a later date after it's agendized. Does I have anybody to make a motion to do that? Um. Be, uh, based on what Fred told us about, it has to be read noticed, yeah, and re-noticed. I, I believe I'm not sure that's what I what I had in mind. That's what I had in mind, but uh, it, there's too much to it. it. That wouldn't be practical. There must be another way to resolve this. So I'll, I'll it, resend I'm, that suggestion. I'm sorry to interrupt. I would add it would probably have to go back to the planning commission to the extent you want to make significant changes. So. Um, there is that consideration, and I think staff would need to understand what the direction is on the particular changes that would be directed. Continue on. I mean, if the, if the question is, are we going to eliminate all these paths and those paseos, the answer is no. We're not going to eliminate those. Those will still be in the preserve. And the new plan shows additional, uh, in the previous plan, it shows additional um, striping for bike lanes. I mean, those are the primary two issues. I mean, there's not changes to p the Paseo. I mean, as far as the width of these um, sidewalks, and we're not eliminating the sidewalks. All we're doing is we're, uh, we have bikes that now have more uh, striping than what was in the previous plan. <laughs> and if you compare the previous plan with the new plan, it's all designated with green. And they match. They match. It's the only two areas. The only two areas that are that have that have changed. We talked about that Rincon Meadows, which we need to, which is already constructed and it's a Class Two lane. We can add that red line. The only other change was at Market Street, and Dennis provided the explanation as to why we changed that because of the reorientation at the school district's request. Originally, again, it ran, the property ran east-west. Now it's running north-south. And the impacts of the pickup and drop-off. And so rather than having a red line, which shows a class two lane, which basically shows um, a bicycle lanes, we're going to go to Cheryl's just telling people that bicyclists can use the road as well. And there's only one other. I mean, again, if you just take the two plans and you look at them, they're, they're they're pretty much identical. And the difference is, is that, the, you know, we, we got more specific when this thing was done in 2003. This was all kind of a conceptual thing. Now we see how people utilize it and we're better defining it. But we aren't going to be ripping out or we're going to be eliminating Paseos and we're adding more bike lanes. And okay. those were the only changes. I mean, if, if the council wants us to go back and restart this, that's that's fine. It's just give us the direction as to what you'd like us to do. If I, if I may, the change isn't the plans. They put the Paseo on the bicycle plan, and I showed you that. The problem is the Paseo has been redefined as not having a Class 1 shared use path within the Paseo. They're not planning on tearing out any of the ones that are there. They're just planning on not fixing them and calling them wide sidewalks, which is what they're calling them on the plans anyway. You talk to the con contractors, they don't know their shared use pass because the plan says sidewalk, and the plans are wrong. So if what staff is saying 
then all they need to do is change the definition on, I believe it's page 144 of the, of the original specific plan, I don't know what the new page number is, um, to require the shared use pass in all the paseos, which it was the original intent of the specific plan of the entire system. And that solves the entire problem. And we're just trying. I, I didn't to object to anything like the, the schools or anything like that. But those things always have to be worked out. There's always unique situations, but you can't eliminate the entire system just because you added a bike lane on a few streets. That doesn't solve the problem. It doesn't create equity for the end users, which is the citizens in the preserve. Okay. We're just attempting to move the bicycle off that that paseo and have bike paths to use. Okay, so at this point, we'll go ahead and, since there's no, nobody wants to make a motion of sending this back for, uh, for another hearing or setting it for another hearing and setting it back potentially to the, the Planning Commission, then I'm going to ask for a vote to move forward with the second reading and, and, and have it as it currently reads at the amendment. Do I have anybody that wants to make that motion? I will make that motion. Anybody second? Okay, so not having a second, what are, what are our options now? Um, you can, continue, can you continue? The, one of the options is you can continue until you have a, a full council to hold this discussion. Okay. So we put this off until we get another. So you can continue this to the January 4th meeting. January 4th. Okay. We'll go ahead and continue this to the January 4th city council meeting. And, and what I'll bring back is just the clarification of the old, I'll, I'll show you the old plan and the new plan and what those changes are. Okay. And I guess, Dennis, just from my perspective seeing this tonight, I, I don't understand the, the benefit of the language change to this community. I understand the, 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 pro the proposed changes you made from an engineering perspective. I, I totally get that. I don't understand the, the, the language change that would allow for the developer to potentially not build through those class one standards in the future. It, it, it does seem like some of the language change that was pointed out tonight does provide an opportunity for us to not deliver on something that we specifically wanted to do in some of those bike lanes in the future. It would provide for some for some wiggle room, I think, for them to say, hey, it doesn't technically say that now that they have to construct that. And I think that's part of um, part of my concern in, in seeing the presentation tonight and part of the discussion I've had in the past with uh, wanting to make sure the residents and the preserve, uh, the preserve agree with that because I don't think a lot of people down there would want to see that either if we, if we were to ask them. Uh, Madam Councilor, if I, if I may, um, the reason the language was changed to allow the flexibility is because those facilities still exist and will continue to exist. Uh, along Pine, along Hellman, and along Kimball, those uh, paseos will still remain class ones. Um, what we're trying to do is elsewhere in the preserve, off of those major arterials inside the community, that we are now allowed the flexibility to not call them a class one bike lane anymore and allow us to put uh, bicyclists in a buffered bike lane on the street or, or where it's appropriate, put them in the street. Um, and so that's why the flexibility was built into there. The intention is not to change uh, that community paseo system at all or to, to eliminate sections of it or to disconnect it from anywhere else. Uh, that part um, of the plan was, was not meant to be modified, nor do I believe it is modified with this amendment. I believe you, Dennis. I do. I believe our staff. I support them. I just wish we'd be more specific about where we would want that flexibility versus just kind of that blanket statement. I do. I think it. I think it allows for maybe some things to be constructed in the future that we would not like to see them just constructed that way. That's all. I. I but I do believe you, and I believe our staff. Thank you. So I would suggest, Mr. Mayor, for the time, a motion, a second, and a roll call to continue it to January 4th. Okay. I'd like to take a motion on continuing this item until the January 3rd uh, City Council meeting. Do I have uh, somebody to make a motion? I believe.
believe it's January 4th. January 4th, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'll make the motion. I have a second? I'll second it. Angela, can we have a roll call? Council Member Flores? Yes. Council Member Comstock? Yes. Council Member Pocock? No. Mayor Pro Tem Lucio? Yes. Motion carries three yes, one no, one absent. Okay, now we're going to go ahead and move on to new business. That's going to be item number 10, purchase order approval for Miracle Playground sales. And then we'll have a staff report by Carolyn Baltazar, project manager. Good evening, Mayor Pro Tim, Lucio, members of the council. In March 2020, the city was awarded the Central and Phillips Park Site Development Project as part of the Prop 68 grant. The project scope of work is developing a new neighborhood park named Chino Rancho Park. And on your screen is a conceptual plan of the park and up on your monitors. Um, included in the park site development is the installation of an all abilities playground in which staff held several p public workshops to gather input for the design. The playground area will include shade sails to cover the equipment during the hot summer months and lighting to light up the area after dark. In addition, a shade shelter with accessible picnic tables and barbecues will be installed adjacent to the playground. And if you look up on your monitor, you can see on item number nine is where the playground's gonna be, and item number seven is where the shade shelter is gonna be. The next picture is um, a layout of the playground. It's for all abilities and all ages, and this is the layout for the playground, for the new playground area. And then the next picture is are the shade sails. That's going to cover the majority of the playground equipment. It does not cover the swings, and we also have a very tall element, kind of a barn style. Um, the shade sails to cover that would would be so high it would not serve any purpose um, with the uh, direction of the sun. So that's why those areas are not covered. Um, to obtain best pricing for the project, staff elected to separate the project into two components. The first component will consist of purchasing the playground equipment, shade sales, and shade shelter directly from the manufacturer, eliminating any contractor markup cost. The second component will consist of bidding the cost of insulation with the park development. The city's purchasing ordinance allows the city to take advantage of competitive bids awarded to vendors by other agencies. SourceWell issued a notice inviting bids and conducted a nationwide competitive bid process. As a result of the SourceWell bid process, Miracle Playground Sales was selected to provide the playground equipment, shade sales, and polygon shade shelter through the bid program. Staff is requesting City Council to approve a purchase order to Miracle Playground Sales, Corona, California, in the amount of $394,898.21 for the direct purchase of the equipment, including engineered drawings. The City's Attorney's Office has reviewed all the documents and found them to be in order. This concludes my report, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Are there any members of the public that would like to address the City Council on this item? Seeing none, any questions from any city council member? Then I would entertain a motion and a second. I make the motion, Mayor Pro Tem. Do I have a second? I'll second. Roll call, please. Council Member Comstock? Yes. Council Member Flores? Yes. Council Member Pocock? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Lucio? Yes. Motion carries, four zero, one absent. Okay. The recommendations, I approve a purchase order in the amount of $394,898.21 for Miracle Playground Sales at Corona for the purchase of the playground equipment, sh shade sales, polygon shade shelter for the Chino Rancho Park Development, <coughs> authorizing the city manager to execute all necessary documents on behalf of the city. Now we move on to item number 11, the State Department of Park and Recreation's per capita program grant award appropriation for Walnut Park Improvement. Appropriate 
per capita grant awarded to the California State Department of Parks and Recreations in the amount of $232,854 from unappropriated reserves of the park fund with the correspondent increase in revenue. We have a staff report by Keith Martinez, Assistant Project Coordinator. Good evening, Mayor Pro Tem Lucio and members of the council. Uh, I'd like to take this time to wish you guys a uh, Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays uh, <laughs> if I don't get a chance to see you after the, uh, the meeting. Uh, the State of California Parks and Water Bond Act of 2018 was passed by voters providing funding opportunities to be distributed to multiple agencies for creating new parks and new recreation opportunities in underserved communities across California. City staff recommended applying for this grant to replace the playground apparatus, install shade coverings, and replace the existing sand and rubber surfacing with a new pour and play surfacing at Walnut Park. If you look at your screen, you will see a conceptual design that we've created, uh, or our consultant has created uh, for you to view what it would look like when we replace it. On September 7th, 2021, the City Council passed Resolution 2021-061 authorizing the city manager to submit an application to the State Department of Parks and Recreation for the per capita grant program. On November 9th, 2021, the per capita grant application in the amount of $232,854 was submitted to the state for the Walnut Park Improvements Project. On December 2nd, 2021, the city was notified by the State Department of Parks and Recreation that the project was approved. The grant requires a 20% match, which will be provided through the park fund. It is staff's recommendation to accept the grant in the amount of $232,854, appropriate $232,854 from the unappropriated reserves of the park fund with a corresponding increase in revenue and authorize the city manager to execute all necessary documents related to the grant. Uh, if we look at the screen here, this is more of a three-dimensional design that you guys get to see of what it could look like uh, once it does go in. And the next slide I will show you, if you're not familiar with Walnut Park, this is the current situation we have out there now. That completes my report, and I would be happy to answer any questions. Are there any members of the public that would like to address the City Council on this item? See none. Is there anybody from the City Council that would like to address this item? No? That, I would entertain a motion in a second. I make the motion. I'll second. Roll call, please. Councilmember Comstock? Yes. Councilmember Flores? Yes. Councilmember Pocock? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Lucio? Yes. Motion carries 4 0. We move on to item number 12 award of contract citywide signage project MS 221. Approve a vendor cap increase and award the contract to Myers and Sons. Highway Safety Inc. for the removal, replacement, and relocation of traffic and street name signs in compliance with the California Manual of Uniform Traffic Control Devices and the city standards. The staff report will be given by David McGabby, Public Works Service Manager, and Dennis Rawls, Transportation Manager. Good evening again, Mayor Pro Tem Howie and City Council. Uh, tonight, as part of the uh, contract award for um, replacing signage throughout the city, uh, we had an opportunity as a city to revamp our identity through the use of street name signs citywide. Um, at a previous council meeting in October, uh, described how uh, our traffic signal street name signs and our, our local road street name signs are different colors. Uh, one's green, one's blue. Um, I showed council then uh, how other agencies surrounding us uh, create their sign standards, some, the majority of them using green, which is a, a typical um, highway standard uh, through the California MTCD. Uh, but there are other agencies who do uh, choose to use other colors like blue. At that meeting, uh, city council gave direction to go ahead and continue down the path of, of converting our street name signs to white text on blue. Um, as part of that, we went through uh, that identity. Currently, our street name signs have the word Chino written vertically on the left edge of the sign um, and some of our, our, our current standards. Uh, you can see on the, the top right of the screen uh, a, a much older sign, a much thicker sign that, uh, from a, 
um, uh, our previous standards before that. And on the bottom right is an example of our current street name signs that are attached to traffic signals. So at the city council meeting previously in October, they presented uh, various options that we could do, including uh, placing the city logo on street name signs, uh, multicolor, full color. Um, but we, uh, uh, as the discussion carried on, it was determined that maybe a monochromatic icon uh, that could best represent Chino might be a better concept for the majority of these signs, as there's going to be thousands of them throughout the city. And that rather we would use uh, the logo and focus that really on gateway entrances into the city. Uh, but I wanted to kind of show you where we went with the icon and where the inspiration for it came from. <laughs> Excuse me. Along the uh, top of the, the screen there is the uh, decorative designs that are intended to be de uh, installed as part of the Central Avenue Bridge project currently under construction. On the bottom left, you see uh, an example of a city kiosk signs. These are uh, posted throughout the city and help provide guidance to uh, city-specific city facilities and items of interest. And on the bottom right is the rose-colored uh, stonework uh, that's at some of our entrance monuments. All of these uh, represent the hills, uh, meant to be the fields, our historical heritage of our dairy lands, with the sun setting behind it and the sunbeams radiating behind it. Um, and in the archway uh, is a common theme seen throughout Chino. And so putting those all together, working with uh, the design concept, we worked on um, with staff, with the council's direction, uh, an icon that we could use on uh, street name signs. Uh, this was the original concept that was presented to city council back in October. Uh, some of the comments we received include um, pulling out the word Chino from the, from the icon, making it stand alone, making it more pronounced, more bigger, easier to read. Uh, so we've done that. Uh, and, and also wanted to show that, you know, previously we have uh, fully capitalized letters on our street name signs. But I think as you'll see in the new variation with uppercase uh, words and lowercase uh, with the remaining word, uh, that it's easier to read, quicker to identify, uh, which is important when you're using these as guide signs on our local streets. Um, so before you tonight are a couple of alternatives. Alternative one uh, shows a, a slightly larger icon uh, on the left uh, with the word Chino separated. And, and presented prominently on the sign. Uh, the second alternative really does, is intended to do the same thing, but shrink that icon a little bit so that it's not so pronounced and uh, really make the word Chino stand out a bit more. Um, and with that, um, I, I'd welcome to answer any questions or, or receive any further direction from the city council on the street name so, uh, sign design uh, before we move on to the contract award. Any questions? Can you, there, can, you, can you flip back and forth a couple of times between one and two? How if I put about them all on the same screen for you? So the, uh, okay. <laughs> those bottom two are the, the current alternatives we're displaying. And the, uh, the live example shown in, inside the, the council chambers uh, I believe the one on the left is alternative two, and the one in the center is alternative one. Any other comments or questions? Um, all I would say is I like the original concept. Um, I'm always a fan of capitalized letters, um, but that's all I have. I would say that the uh, 12,800 block of Easy Street is an actual Chino address. So we already have one sign ready to go. <laughs> <laughs> Any other comments? No? Okay, do we just move forward to the award, or do we have to pick a design? Yeah, so what was recommended, I know that the mayor also, uh, unfortunately, she wasn't able to be here tonight, but uh, we had gotten her input, and uh, alternative number one was the, the preferred one. And so we just needed that, yeah, the, the endorsement of that so that we can go ahead and move forward with the ordering of the signs and start with the first phase. Again, this is going to take over a three- to five-year period to replace out all the signs. This is phase one. Okay. So we got one. Uh, Councilman Flores likes original concept one. 
Mayor Eunice Yola likes Alternative One. Any issues with Alternative One over any of the other ones? Walt, any particular preference <laughs> that you like? Uh, I, I'm ambivalent between one and two. Um, I like uh, one, I think uh, alternate one. Councilperson Comstock? <laughs> I'm fine with alternative one as well. Uh, I'm also good with alternative one. I, I see that the only difference between alternative one and alternative two is they're lowering Chino, um, a little lower than the, than the, I guess the city logo. But I think uh, alternative one is fine. I, I think that it's easy to read, and I think uh, I, I don't like the space in between the, the sign and the logo, or at least the, the name of the city and the logo. So I, I like alternative one. So I, I guess that would be four to one for alternative <laughs> one. Thanks for that direction. I'll now hand it over to Mr. McAbee for the remainder of the presentation. Good evening, Mayor Pro Tem and members of council. As part of the city's ongoing right-of-way maintenance and, and in response to city council's direction, staff created the citywide signage project MS-221. The project's scope is to remove, relocate, and or replace existing traffic and street name signs throughout the city. This project will identify and, and allow updating of any signs that may be out of compliance with the current California Manual on Uniform Traffic Control Devices standards and the city's current standard plan specifications. The project will also allow staff to identify signs that are no longer required and can be removed. Uh, Public Works Services Division currently maintains approximately 6,160 traffic signs mm -hmm. and 1,206 street name signs throughout the city. Staff estimates removing, replacing, and or relocating approximately 2,000 signs per year. This project will improve aesthetics, visibility, consistency, and safety for our motorists, bicyclists, and pedestrians. Staff anticipates the contract will be renewed annually with the expenditures accounted for in future fiscal year budget cycles. Specifications were prepared, and on November 1st, 2021, a notice inviting bids was released and published on Planet Bids and in the Chino Champion. On November 22nd, 2021, the city received five bids. Myers and Sons Highway Safety Incorporated of Chino, California was determined to be the lowest and most responsive bidder. Therefore, staff recommends that City Council approve the following, increase the vendor cap for Myers and Sons Highway Safety, award a contract to Myers and Sons Highway Safety in the annual amount of $252,039.97, approve annual expenditures of $37,806 for project contingencies management and inspection for a potential total annual contract amount not to exceed $289,845.97. That concludes my report and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Are there any members of the public that would like to address the city council on this item? Seeing none, is there any comments or questions from any city council members? No. Uh, the only thing I have is uh, I appreciate you guys putting this together for us. Um, I think it's it's long overdue. I do like the fact that we're actually putting our logo on the city signs. All our other neighboring cities have their logo, Ontario, Chino Hills. So I'm glad that we're moving in that direction. I'm also glad that uh, we're starting to upgrade our signs because some of them are long overdue. And uh, one of the things that, that I'd really like to see is that we start uh, focusing on our appearance as a city. So I thank you guys for bringing this to us. I thank you for your presentation and uh, I'm excited to see these signs starting to go up. Any other comments? They're gonna look great. I just wanna confirm that the ones on the major streets are gonna have the city seal to the left. Is that correct, Dennis? Yeah, I think what we talked about in a previous city council meeting is that at uh, some of the gateway entrances in the city, some of the major entrances in the city, that we would have a full color logo included on um, the street name signs. Um, uh, Angela, if you can go back to my presentation for a moment. Very similar to how the, um, the, the street name sign on this traffic signal at the uh, on, was that Walnut at 10th? directing traffic towards the police station. Very similar to this, where the, the full city logo would be placed 
uh, adjacent to this, the street name sign. So yeah, uh, we'll be working with that, um, mostly on traffic signals like this, uh, but certainly anywhere where there's a, a major entrance in and out of the city so that people know they're entering Chino. That's great, Dennis. I agree with the, the Mayor Pertem's comments. Thank you very much. It's gonna look very nice. And a lot of our signs are really aged and you know in desperate need of repair. So this is gonna be nice, nice for, for our community and our city. Okay, so at this time I would entertain a motion and a second. I'll make a motion. And if I may suggest that the alternative be included in the motion. Okay. Uh, I'll entertain a motion to pick alternative number one as uh, the new signs for the city of Chino. And I'll take I'll, a motion and a second, please. I'll make a yeah, Sorry, you could create a, a motion to approve every the agreement as well. I was just suggesting to clarify the alternative in the motion. Okay, I make the motion to accept the agreement and alternative number one. So I'd like a, somebody to make a motion and a second, please. I'll make a motion. I'll make the second. Council Member Flores? Yes. Council Member Comstock? Yes. Council Member Pocock? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Lucio? Yes. Motion carries 4 0. So at this time and place for the mayor and council members to report on pre scheduled council committee assignment meetings that were held since the last regular council meeting and any other items of interest upon request by an individual council member, the city council may choose to take action on any of the subjects matters listed below. So I'll start off. So on December 8th, uh, I attended an investment committee meeting. On December 8th, I also attended a meeting with Eric Fiske uh, regarding a development that he would like to develop in the preserve. Uh, on December 8th, I also attended the Chino Valley Chamber of Commerce luncheon at the Volano. I will say, uh, attending that, looking at what it once was to where it, what it is today, it's, it's, it's heartbreaking because that, that development and that golf course was absolutely gorgeous at one time and, and seeing in the, the, the current condition that it's in, it's, a, it's sad and hopefully they can do something to, to revive that because it used to be an icon at one time. But uh, the, the Chamber of Commerce luncheon was, was, was great. Uh, they gave a lot of prizes out, a lot of keynote speakers from within the community that had businesses. So it was good to see how they were trying to mentor the new people in, in the Chamber of Commerce to see how they can generate additional business. So it was good to see the camaraderie between all the local businesses that we have in the community. On December 8th, I also attended the Chino Valley Fire Board meeting uh, on December 10th. I attended the Chino Police Officers uh, Christmas Party, the POA Christmas Party, a great turnout. Uh, it was a good time. A little cold, but uh, my wife and I really enjoyed it. We enjoyed um, just uh, being with you guys. You guys uh, do a great job for us, and, and uh, we really like to, to thank you for the, for the job and the commitment that you guys give this community. And on uh, December 11th, we attended the, the Chino Youth Christmas Parade. Uh, I was thankful that staff was able to come up with a vehicle to be able to have all my family be able to, and we were missing a few so uh, but it was nice to be able to put them all in a car because normally we're in a convertible but there's no way that I can fit all my kids in the convertible so I really thank you guys for that it was a great turnout it was great to see the community back out there it was a little thinner than it normally is uh, I think people are still a little bit uh, hesitant to come out but um, it looks like hopefully, uh, you know, we don't move forward in California to start shutting us down because I think people are just starting to come back. So hopefully we can get through this, uh, this, this month of, uh, of new restrictions that have been placed on us and hopefully we can get past this uh, pandemic this coming year. On uh, December 13th, I met with the city manager. On December 13th, I also had a meeting with Mr. Zach Miller, who was here earlier. Uh, he had some concerns about the preserve. We had a lengthy meeting with them. Uh, we kind of explained to him historically some of the things that have occurred and why the, why the preserve is in the in the condition it's in right now, and some of the the things that we we're going to try to move forward to ensure that they have a, a better a better road system around there, and uh, some of the other concerns that he had. Uh, on December fifteenth. I attended the event uh, put on by the fire department and the police department, uh, which was the Make a Child Smile at the Walmart. 
I think they ended up having something like six, six bus loads of kids. Uh, everybody seemed to have a good time. Uh, I think my kids wished that they were in the line, but uh, <laughs> I had to explain to them that it was, it, it was, for, it was for individuals that, uh, that are in, in need during these holiday seasons. And I explained to them, at least as best I could, that the work that you guys do to, to generate money and funds and, and toys to give to people that are less fortunate. So my hat's off to you guys. Um, I think that's one of the reasons that that the police department and the fire department have such a great relationship with the community is just the extra things that you guys do on a regular basis to show the community that we're all one. So um, I thank you for your personal relationships that you guys build and for the events that you guys put forward. Um, on December 19th, I met with uh, Stubby Barr regarding some of the issues that he brought up today uh, regarding the preserve specific plan. And then uh, I just want to finish with, I just want to wish everybody a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Um, I, I always take New Year's Eve as a, as a reflection on uh, what has passed uh, in, the, in the previous year, people that we've lost, people that, uh, you know, changes in our lives. And uh, I always try to reflect on, to see what the significant changes this year brought. Obviously, there's going to be some that we celebrate, and there's going to be some that we look at and we try to learn and, and grow from. So my, uh, my feeling is just for everybody, go out there, spend as much time as you can with your family. If, if you have family around you, you're better off than a lot of people. So take advantage of your family members. Uh, enjoy the holidays. Be with them. But most importantly, you know, with holidays and at the, this time of year, a lot of depression occurs, and people get suicidal thoughts. So if you got friends, relatives that you start seeing that potentially are not uh, interacting and, they, and they're pulling away, please make sure that you reach out to them, keep an eye on them because, you know, we're losing too many people nowadays and, uh, you know, suicides are high uh, during these holidays. So please keep an eye on your family members and your loved ones. And uh, with that, uh, everybody, I just wish you a happy new year and a Merry Christmas and I'll see you next year. And uh, Councilperson Comstock. Thank you, sir. On December 8th, I attended the same meeting with Mr. Eric Fiske with the Mayor Pro Tem in the city manager's office about a proposed development he has had, had brought forward. Uh, on that same day, I also attended the Chino Valley Chamber of Commerce uh, Christmas luncheon at Volano, which has already been previously mentioned. On December 10th, I attended the Chino Police Officers Association Christmas party at the Plains of Fame Museum. I was uh, sh short for there because I also had a, I was a double commitment with my family that night. It was nice to see some of my former co-workers. It's always a nice evening. Um, and to uh, just see the, the employees having a nice time together and you know having their family members, you know, their, their wives or their significant others out for a date. It's always a nice event. So good job to them. On December 11th, I also participated in the Chino Youth Christmas Parade. I want to thank all of our staff and community services, public works for making that a great day. As has also been mentioned, it was nice to see everybody back out on the parade route um, and, and connecting in a, in a personal way. It was a, a very fun morning. I was happy we didn't get any rain. And again, I want to thank the police department for allowing for me to ride in the uh, rescued arm of, armored vehicle. It was fun. On December 13th, I also uh, met with Zach Miller and Mayor Pro Tem Lucio about some of his concerns in the preserve, um, as, as, as uh, some of those were uh, also voiced by him this evening in tonight's meeting. On the same date at 1 p.m., I met with legal counsel uh, uh, regarding uh, ongoing litigation um, with the city of Chino um, from 1 to 4 in that afternoon. Uh, on the 15th, I wasn't able to make to make the Make a Child Small event this year uh, due to a previous commitment, but I was able to go to the employee luncheon at 11.30 in the morning, and that's just always a great event. It was just so nice to see all of our employees together, and just, again, thank you to staff and everybody in Avon who had any part in that. And I know there's a lot of donations that, uh, from some of our corporate sponsors in the community, but also contributions from our own EMT and staff members to just make that a, a great event. So everything about that was, was fun and nice that day. On the 16th, for a short period of time, I attended the school board meeting, um, and then I watched the rest of it online. Um, 
that was mostly organizational. There was a change in some of the committee assignments to the board. Christina Gagne is actually the board president now. Um, um, uh, one of the most significant changes for us is Ms. Gagne and Mr. Na are now our liaisons to the city of Chino. And they're still dealing with a, a multitude of just different parent concerns behind vaccines, masks, and different things. Two things that did happen at that meeting that night that I thought were very nice was um, the Boys Republic actually pre presented a Della Robia wreath to, to the school board. I thought it was pretty classy, especially with our, our relationship with the Boys Republic, so I thought maybe it would be something we could consider for to future years, as um, well as they had an employee retire from the, from the district with 47 years of service all in the same assignment at the adult school uh, to the ESL program. And her first name was Blanca, uh, I, I can't, I wanna say Magdalena's, but 47 years of service to, to, our, mm -hmm. to our community is, is quite outstanding, so I wanted to congratulate her and her family tonight for that. On the 18th, I was reading the champion and saw that a group of bicyclists were going to meet up at, uh, at Mountain and Riverside Drive and take a little bike tour through the San Antonio and kind of, um, uh, um, walnut uh, area where s some people uh, decorate heav heavily for Christmas lights. I would say there was probably about 75 people that met up there that night. W with my luck, I got to bump into the police association who stopped in at the Starbucks to get some hot cocoa. So I, I, I like to call that a twofer. I was able to see Santa being escorted by the police department. They were actually headed down to the preserve. So it's always nice to see that sleigh back out there and working. That's a great community outreach effort. See some, a couple of retirees are on the sleigh. And, uh, um, and Curtis Burton and Frank Minna and some of the people working, and then enjoy the bike ride with, with some family members and friends. It was cold, we left, uh, we peeled off a little early, but we did enjoy that, and there was, there was a lot of people, a lot of participation in bikes and cars and pedestrians up there, so that was nice to see. And, um, of course, tonight I attended a closed session, and uh, I also wanna wish everybody a Merry Christmas, and. A Sorry about that. Also, I wish everybody a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Uh, be safe during this holiday season, designated driver. And um, I, 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 too, believe that we have a lot to be grateful for. I'm very grateful for my family, my friends, the great community that we live in. I'm also grateful for our staff, you know, all of our employees, all the hard work that they put in all year long. Um, we could not do that without you. Um, you know, it, it, again, I know at, at times the... Uh, the council has changed, and we're trying to trying to do things a little bit differently or going a little bit a different direction on things, but it should not devalue how we feel about you. In fact, I made it a point at the employee holiday luncheon to go to every table that I could and tell everybody, thank you for your service. Um, and we're looking forward to you know, 2022 getting ushered in and having a, a great year of hard work and getting, getting things accomplished and, and, and getting work done. So thank you very much, sir. Council Member Flores. Hi, good evening. Uh, on the 8th, I attended the investment committee meeting. Um, that same day, I also attended the community workshop uh, redistricting. On the 10th of December, I attended the Chino um, POA Christmas party. Um, great turnout. I won a prize there. That was pretty cool. Um, on the 11th, I attended the Chino Youth Christmas Parade and Fair. Um, I, great turnout. I had a great time. Um, I think for this next coming year, I would like to um, possibly entertain the possibility of the council having to float ourselves and, you know, seeing if we can win. Um, but that's, uh, that's for, the, uh, for a year from now. Um, that same day, I also attended the You Choose a Toy Giveaway. Um, great turnout there. I kind of sh showed up towards the end of the giveaway. But, um, you know, as always, You Choose and our police department always do a great job um, of um, engaging with our community, specifically our, um, our youth. On the 15th, I attended the Make a Child Smile event. Um, Another great turnout. Uh, thank you to our to our to our fire, um, our, our Chino Valley Fire Department. They um, it was my first time there, and um, I had heard a lot of great stories. Um, I think a couple of the things I was impressed with is um, you know this this event has gotten so big now. There's different agencies involved. Um, I seen corrections there. I seen um, you know the sheriff's department there, and just other agencies that were involved. And it was just pretty cool to see the you know the entire community gather together and you know um, make a child smile. Um, uh, that same day, I also attended the employee luncheon. Um, 
great turnout. Um, unfortunately, I wasn't able to win a prize. That was for the employees only, but we had a good time. On the 17th, I attended the Achino Neighborhood House Toy Giveaway. Um, that was another great event. Um, I really liked this event, um, specifically because they put me to work. Um, sometimes I don't like just showing up to events and you know smiling and all. I just like showing up and getting to work, so that was pretty good. Um, I just want to give... Um, I don't see any preserve residents here anymore, but um, I was grateful they, you know, they they uh, they showed up tonight. Tonight, um, I'm grateful for our residents for um, you know just voicing their opinions, and um, I think um, I you know I want to address our city ma our, our city manager Matt. Um, I I just love the way you I guess engaged with those residents and you know laid it out and let them know what it was. I'm most truly heartfelt, and I think they I think they received that real well. So thank you for that. Um, and last but not least, the tomorrow, or the 22nd, there is the Isaiah's Rock Toy Giveaway. Um, it's going to be over here at the um, the parking lot. Um, I, I invite the entire community to um, to, to attend the event. Um, I would I would invite our, our police department to event to to attend the event. I would you know invite our fire to attend and you know just kind of show up and um, you know support um, Isaiah's Rock. Um, but with that being said, um, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, and um, I hope uh, well I'll see you next year. Oh, actually, one last thing. Um, I'm not sure who provided these, but I think I have an idea of who provided these. Uh, Brenda, thank you. Um, if we can keep the containers, awesome. If I have to return it, no problem. <laughs> I'll return if it can get filled. And Council Member Pocock. Thank you. Um, on the 8th, <clears throat> I attended the, the chamber luncheon up in uh, Villano <clears throat> with... with uh, Council Member uh, Comstock and Member Tim Lucio, and uh, that that was a very well put on event. On uh, the tenth, I had an appointment with uh, Supervisor Kurt Hagman at his office. Also on the tenth, I attended the Chino Police Officers Association Christmas Rally, which was very well put on. Congratulations for a good good event. A good. Good to see the camaraderie between all of your unions that are together and and uh, get along fine. <clears throat> um, then on the eleventh, the the Christmas first uh, the Christmas parade um, that was fun. That's always fun. The Christmas parade I really enjoyed that. I took brought my daughter with me and uh, we rode along in my old fifty six truck and had a great time. Um, 15th, I visited the Make a Child Smile with a couple of my compadres up here, and uh, that was my first time also. All the time I've been in Chino and been involved in Chino's, my first time to make a sm child smile, and that, that was uh, eye-opening and heartwarming for me. Um, then uh, after that, uh, the employee luncheon, which uh, congratulations to the staff. That was very well put on event. I, I enjoyed it. Food was good, and our master ceremonies was exemplary. <laughs> um, then on the 16th, I stopped by uh, Debbie Henry's retirement, which was it was a nice little event and uh, retirement event, and um, she helped us at the corn feed run over the years a lot making sure we got our permits, making sure we had all of our legal technicalities in order, and I really appreciate her. I enjoyed working with her. And then 17th, I stopped by the neighborhood house uh, giveaway over at the community building, saw a commissioner, I mean, Councilman Forrest over there, and I got there at the tail end of it, but they, they uh, I saw pictures after that that community building was full of toys, and uh, when I, when I saw it, it was about 5% full of toys. And uh, it, it, so a lot of kids had a lot of, had a lot of fun and got a lot of toys there. And um, um, uh, I'd like to say happy birthday to my brother today. Happy birthday, Gary. And I'd like to mention that uh, last night the sled, the Santa sled came down my street and with the sirens going and uh, a lot of ho-ho and a lot of lights and hoopla. And thank you, PD, for doing that. I mean, you made a lot of kids happy. I don't know how many miles you take that around uh, the city on, on this time of year, but uh, 
I'm sure a lot of a lot of you guys work really hard, and it's probably all volunteers. And, and uh, thank you very much for that. That concludes my story. Thank you. Oh, uh, Brenda, thank you for the cookies. <laughs> thank you, Brenda. <laughs> and uh, city manager. Uh, thank you, Mayor Pro Tem Lucio. I uh, want to wish everybody a, a happy Christmas or Merry Christmas and a happy New Year. And I have no report. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. City Attorney Galante. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor Pro Tem, members of the council. Um, as I've done in past years, I will compile a list of some relevant legislation that will take effect next year that uh, may be of interest to this council, and I'll, I'll circulate that in the coming year. But uh, beyond that, uh, just wishing everybody a Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. Thank you. Thank you. And Chief Simmons. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem and members of the council. Just wanted to, again, thank you guys for the addition of our traffic officer. Uh, I don't know if you've been seeing him out there, um, but uh, he, he's been very active. In fact, last Thursday, he coordinated a maximum uh, truck route enforcement operation, and in a total of four hours, um, they wrote 75 truck route citations. So we're getting the word out to, uh, to these trucks that they need to abide by uh, our municipal code, and um, we're gonna continue to make, uh, make efforts on that. I also want to wish everybody a very Merry Christmas um, from the men and women of the Chino Police Department. We don't want to be the Grinch, though, so I want to encourage people not to drink and drive. We already did a checkpoint uh, on Friday night and arrested two drunk drivers, and we will be out in force up, uh, up until the, uh, the uh, New Year. Um, and in fact, on New Year's Eve, we'll have over 30 of our personnel out there keeping this community safe. So. Be safe, don't drink and drive, and have a very Merry Christmas. I just want to tell you uh, thanks for the, the work that you guys did yesterday in, in College Park. Um, outstanding. I, I was told you guys got a, some people in a stolen car that, yep. that fled, and, but you guys took everybody in custody, and, and it happened pretty quickly. And I'm glad that you guys are out there doing what you're doing. A lot of communities are suffering from this uh, defund the police. I'm glad that this, as a city, never went in that direction and that we still have police officers that are out there doing the Lord's work and I appreciate it. Thank you very much. And Chief, if I can just quickly mention, I can attest to last Thursday. Um, I, for those of you who don't know, I live about a block away from uh, Central Avenue and you know, one thing I've always said is, you know, I feel like we need more Christmas lights on Central and let me tell you, that day, I mean, there was, it was uh, a- lot of blue and red? Red, white and blue, yeah. <laughs> so, thank you. You're welcome. From the fire department? Good evening, uh, Mayor Tim, or Mayor Pro Tem Lucio, excuse me, city council members and staff. Um, as we celebrate the reason for the season this weekend with family and friends, we wanna take this opportunity to remind everyone of the potential unseen dangers that may lurk in our homes this time of year. Please remember to properly care for your Christmas trees and take them out of your home at the first sign that the needles may be dying. A dead or dying Christmas tree is extremely flammable and leads to thousands of house fires each year. As you enjoy your Christmas decorations and lights, please ensure not to overload your electrical outlets or circuits. This can pose a significant electrocution hazard and can cause fires as well. And then lastly, as you prepare your holiday meals, please have a fire extinguisher ready to go in the event of an oven fire. Sadly, across America this time of year brings more house fires than any other season. On a brighter and lighter note, uh, as this year comes to an end, we wanna say thank you to the city of Chino, our city council members and our community members for the honor and privilege it is to serve and to protect. May God's favor and provision continue to be on the city of Chino and its people. And we want to say have a very Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. End of report. Thank, thank you. Thank you. And thank you for everything you guys did. You guys did a great job on that. Make a kid smile event. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Have a good evening. And with that, uh, we're going to adjourn. And the next regular meeting for the city council will be held on Tuesday, January 4th, 2022. I'm yeah, 2022 at 7 p.m., closed session at 6 p.m. if necessary in these council chambers.